Welcome to Everyone Loves Guitar, where we sit down and talk with interesting professional guitar players, uncover their stories, and discover what makes them tick. If you love guitar, music, and the backstory of people's lives, stick around. You're in the right place. Hi, this is Craig. Just want to let you know you can now advertise here on Everyone Loves Guitar podcast. For more information, go to everyonelovesguitar.com forward slash advertise. That's everyonelovesguitar.com forward slash advertise. Hey, everybody. This is Craig Garber with Everyone Loves Guitar. And man, I got such a freaking cool guest. I've been looking so, so, so much looking forward to talking with Jimmy Vivino because he's a really interesting guy. He's got a lot of experience. He's a little bashful, so I don't know how much he'll be able to talk, but we'll, we'll see. <laughs> we'll, do, we'll do the best we can. Jimmy's been the lead guitar player and music director on uh, Conan, obviously, for a long time. He, in fact, he's been the consistent element in Conan O'Brien's late night career, starting with the first episode of Late Night with Conan O'Brien in September 1993. That is long than, much longer than most marriages last. Um, when not appearing weeknights on TBS, Jimmy divides his time between recording sessions and live gigs throughout the country, and he plays all over and with loads of people, if you don't know that. In addition to his solo work, he plays with the Prisoners of Second Avenue, Rumble and Twang with Lee Rocker, the Barn Burners, the Recuperators, and the successful Beatles tribute band, the Fab Foe. He's also recorded and played live, and I'm you know, this is like a pimple on the elephant's ass because this is like a tiny little uh, with people like Johnny Johnson, Hubert Sumlin, Levon Helm, Al Cooper, Government Yule, and others. In fact, I rem- I have a you got you did a New Year's thing with Government Mule one year, and you guys were was right after Hubert Sumlin passed. And I remember you were talking about Hubert never used a pick, so you all didn't use picks for that jam. Yeah, do you, ha- yeah, do you remember that? that might one of those mule mule. Was it Mulier's Eve? Yeah, uh, Mule, it was at the Beacon. I'm pretty sure it was. Yeah, and I'm I, I'm I happen to always be uh, in New York for that week. The, the Fab Fo does a a run at the City Winery, like Very eight cool. shows in six days, you know. And and then I run, I you know, and the guys know. Look, when that when this show is over, I'm not talking to anybody. I'm getting in a car, waiting for me outside. It's like a bank <laughs> robbery, and I'm heading up to the Beacon Theater. You know, to get on, get on the last set with the mule. Yeah, you know, and that's usually on the thirtieth and thirty first. I'll go both yeah. nights because hey, I'm a whore. You know, I <laughs> man, I saw that own whore because Warren. You know, oh. uh, Warren has inspired me like more than any 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 guitarist living. Um, you know, any post seventies, sixties, seventies sure. guitar player, Warren Haynes has has inspired me to 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 be better and to. Always, always look for tone, you know, in everything. So, so I every any chance we get to play is is just, just, just Christmas for me. So, um, yeah, yeah, we did that when Hubert passed, and you know, I, I spent a lot of time as I look back with, you know, people who stepped out of my record collection into my life, and that's you know one of the most amazing things to take with you. You know, we all leave at some time. But I couldn't have asked for anything more than that, you know. Um, you, you, you're a kid, and you get those records, and you put them on, and they take you. And even now, still, somebody listening to a, a piece of music, they take you into places that uh, you know. I, I started fantasizing about God. What, you know what? You know where was? What did the recording session look like? You know what was? How many guys are who's playing? So then I started searching researching who's playing on this track you know by Dion and the Belmonts what's sure. the band you know what's the and then and that's been like a quest and finally getting to know Dion one of my best friends and asking him who played on the Wanderer and he tells me it's it's Panama Francis on drums it's uh it's um Mickey Baker and Bucky Pizzarelli on guitars can you get further apart in the universe yeah yeah you know Milt Hinton the judge on bass Ticho on piano and, uh, you know, and, the, and it was live in the room with the band sing, those guys singing and the band playing. And uh, and that's how they made records. And, you know, in the you know, they did takes. Yeah, sure. Take, 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 take. And we always imagine about the blues guys, especially, oh, they just went in and burned through this shit, you know. But no, you now we get Howlin' Wolf, take 49, you know. <laughs> OK, they go two bars in, they stop. 
you know, somebody screwed up. So the take we get is always the best take. Yeah. The, the one that's released with anything, you know, all this unreleased stuff is for archaeology's sake. So that's yeah, so uh, true, Ed man. Warren was one of those guys. And I heard Warren Hayes. I was playing. Um, I had a little gig uptown on 94th street at a place called Hades. And, and, uh, you know, people used to come in and sit in. I had like a band called a little big band and we had like three horns and, Jeff Young on on organ and Kevin Bentz on piano and Harvey Brooks was playing bass. And oh wow! It was like a, just like a great little band and Fagan would come over. He lived around the corner and he'd sit in and and one night in that place Warren walks in with uh, I think with Dickie and maybe a little kid in tow. You know that was going to come D- up and play. Yeah, Derek, you know, a little kid, of course. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you and you're like you hear that and you go what what this is something I haven't tapped into. Here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> There's something in the water down south, you know, that's uh, that's growing these guitar players forever, you know. Yeah. And I think it ends at DC with Roger Cannon, <laughs> with Danny Gatton and Roger Cannon and Bill Lofgren are from, you know, yeah. and, and Bill Kirchin. Yeah. All those cats. And and DC, like that's why there's always been anytime anybody says to me, Oh, is is DC like it's north in the Mason Dixon line, but isn't it like the South really, the Virginia DC area? I say, Yeah, listen to the musicians. I yeah. You know, it is true. And uh, and then it's it's sort of um, there was something about uh, Warren's uh, attack and touch. And he played my Strat. Oh, wow. I, I've, I've only seen and him play Strat like sounded, once. No, but he sounded just like B.B. King on the Strat. And he sang. <laughs> and I said, my God, how come I don't know this guy? Yeah. He was just sitting in, you know, and uh, and we got to be fast friends. And and then Mule came around on the show. The original with Woody, the trio, mm-hmm. you know, and uh, it was one of the first things they did when they came out. And I was like, I, I got to have a trio, which is why I have Prisoners of Second Avenue uh, busted out and said, look, I just got to play. Every guitar player uh, owes it to himself to just play with a bass player and drummer and and just get down in the dirt like that, you know, and and uh, and practice some unsafe guitar. It's like take your guitar, plug it into an amp and get a tone. That's it. Nothing between the guitar and the amp. Hey, so look. anyway, I don't I don't know where we're going, but I was just saying that uh, that the people that come into your life, it, it, most of the time, it's completely what you would expect and a joyful experience. Or it's Chuck Berry, and when it's Chuck Berry, <laughs> you still walk away saying, "My God, I don't care what he just did to me." <laughs> listen to that music, and well, listen to who he is, and look at what he went through. How dare I think that it's important that he that he's nice to me you know i just have to be in the room breathing the same air as this guy that's enough you know and the other thing you never know is if you meet somebody on their worst day you can't walk away with an opinion of them you have to give them at least two times so you know chuck finally got nice it took a long time it took a long and it took johnny johnson to take him into a room and speak to him about his band really and then he finally and then he got nice and then he got nice because if you walk into a situation with a chip on your shoulder, you're always going to be that guy all, until all somebody time. that you respect takes you aside and says, "Don't, don't be that guy with with around my guys." And that's what Johnny did about me and Mike Merritt and James Wormworth, who really cut our teeth in that band with Johnny. That's where we that's where we just stepped up our uh, playing uh, by playing with somebody that was that deep, you know. Um, we can assimilate, assimilate, assimilate all we want from records. But when you get in the trenches with one of those cats, man, you know, especially the side men like Johnny and Hubert, yeah, you know, and and, and Henry Gray and and uh, you know Roy Gaines, all these great players that are still around. It's funny how the side men outlived all the all the stars. All the stars. Look, so you work, you play with Bob Margolin, or you play with any of those guys from Muddy's band, or they're still around. And you and you realize that the, you know the stars lived the high life back then, and they and they and they died quicker too. I think. Um, it I was interviewed a hard Bob. Life. Okay. It was a hard life in yeah. the blues, you know. And that's why Dylan won't leave the road, man. You know? <laughs> he's, he's, he's afraid he'll die. Stay there. <laughs> also, well, I think that he he might creatively die if he wasn't out there being sure. valid, you know. And Willie does the same thing. Yeah. He's out there, man, and uh, and I respect that. You know, people always say, oh, Bob doesn't need the money. Well, you're getting it wrong then. That's yeah. not why Bob is there. You know, after all, you know, he's like the sun in the universe of songwriting and sure. music and everything we everything we know, uh, you know, about about pop music. Not pop, not the kind of pop music I'm talking about, but pop rock music. Pop rock, yeah. 
that that we love, you know, the birds and, you know, the Beatles, the Stones, all that, you know, Bob Dylan, the band, of course, all of that, what we call Americana now was just Bob making music, you know, and, and, and really just playing the blues when it comes down to it. You know, he's, he's like a blues man and that's why he's out on the road. So yeah, meeting these people, um, uh, and playing with them is, uh, is, was, is key to me just wanting to still, still search out for the people, I, people I haven't played with, you know, it's more important to me than me. <laughs> well, let me know? ask you something about that. You said a few minutes ago that you've, you've, you know, you've met a lot of these guys on records that you listened to as a kid. Has there been anybody you met, not because you were starstruck, but because their music was so embedded in your DNA that it was like totally weird? In, in, a, in a good way, like surreal is probably a better word. Well, surreal is always, but well, the the initial thing is surreal when you when you go and you say, "Oh, listen, Al Green wants to talk to you." Go in the room, talk <laughs> to Al Green, and you sit down with him, and he's just like the sweetest cat yeah. ever, you know. And he's got, and you look down, and he's got, he's got silver glitter socks on, you know. I'm like, wow, he's like Michael Jackson must, must have sat in this room, very room. Yeah, and yeah. then took the socks away with him, besides <laughs> great music. Uh, it, the spirituality of Al Green is like, and B.B. King, he's a Buddha. You know, there was always that. You remember the old saying, Eric Clapton is God? Sure, of course. Yeah. Well, then B.B. must be Buddha, yeah. you know, because, you know, uh, I always said, well, then who the hell is B.B.? Because Eric never bought that anyway. You know, and that's the beauty of Eric Clapton. He always shunned all that. You know all that superstar crap. I think it. I think it. It steered him into musical directions. You know to get away from the guitar hero thing and more into music. You know songs. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. You know that's the, the. There's a funny thing. I have a theory about having played with Lee Von Helm for so long and been such a good friend and and been inside that band camp and worked with him and. You know, I even have a record that's unreleased that has Lee Von and Danko and and uh, and. Richard Bell and Garth, you know, and Jimmy Weed. Are like the band You're the kidding me? Yeah, I, 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 ma I made a record with those guys, um, and Johnny Johnson's on it. Everybody started dying up from un out from under the project, and I was like, man, I'm not putting this out. I'm not going to be that guy that, oh, you, you, know, you know, feeding off the bones of the. Oh, of but it's been years people. now. I, I don't. That wouldn't. Well, it's been many years. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm finishing that. That's what I'm. I'm gonna get get that mixed and finished, and it was and it was in done in Levon's barn. But what I learned about that situation was how they worked, because I'm so used to from working in movies and TV and even on Broadway, but then in blues bands and, and running my own bands, is you walk in and you're everyone's prepared and you rehearse and you go bang, you do a bang. But these guys feel it out. Nobody tells anybody anything, and they play and play and play and play until it, until it's right. So that what you have then is not something that an arranger put together, but that you have a band actually playing. You know, when we had the Ramble band, we would never really rehearse. We would just keep throwing these songs out and Levon would go, oh, you got, you know, making that little inch sign with his finger. We came that close, that close over and over until finally when you get it and he'll say, yeah, I think we got it that time, you know, and you feel like you really accomplished something. And uh, or if he would say, "Great, vo you did a great vocal," you know if you, that came from Lee Von Helm, it was incredible. But um, when they came along, they were just a backup band for Ronnie Hawkins, yeah. playing the way they played. You know, uh, there was no 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 thing called Americana. They were working in clubs up, you know, in in Mont in uh, Ontario rather up in Toronto, you know, on Young Street or Bloor Street or wherever they were up there playing the club scene, and. Uh, and doing their version of everything they ever heard, be it, and it came from the Canadians, like country music. You know, Rick Danko was like a Fernland Husky. You know, <laughs> his favorite guys were all those country singers. And Richard Manuel was the Ray Charles head. And then you had Garth, who had all this Anglican church, you know, funeral home organ. His his uncle ran a funeral parlor up there in uh, New London and uh, Ontario, and and you hear all that. Messian, Black Mass, all that stuff coming through. And then you have Levon from Arkansas. Yeah. You know, who saw, who, who bought a drum kit after he saw Peck Curtis playing with Sonny Boy Williamson. You that's, know, that's in a story. Arkansas. Interesting. And he saw, and he saw DJ Fontana come through with Elvis on a flatbed, you know, in Helena. Yeah. yeah. He, him, and his, him and his family came up from Turkey Scratch to, to go to Helena to, to see Elvis Presley play in on a, on a, 
you know, in a truck, basically, you know, set up with a generator probably louder than the amps. And uh, and then you had Robbie, who really, you know, just oversaw this whole stew that was happening, you know, and uh, and pulled it together into something that we now call Americana. But Bob Dylan saw that, took full advantage of it. And by the time that basement tape stuff got out to England, it, it wrecked everybody in England. So you hear it right away. You hear that cream breaks up. Eric wants to come to Woodstock to join the band. You know, the Beatles, George Harrison's in there bringing all things must pass. If you've heard the boot. Oh, of it. what a great. And, and, it, and they're trying to be tears of rage. He's got the Leslie guitar going. Everything about it wants to be the band. Paul McCartney walks into the into the let it be section looking like Garth Hudson. With a big beard, yeah. you know, for the and a, and a long like you know a long like way, you know long frock coat on, and he looks like he looks like yeah. he walked out of the band's album cover, and uh, and Elton John makes Tumbleweed Connection. Right, right. man, you know I never put this all together. This. Oh, so they yeah, were yeah. they were and continuously they wrecked, wrecked everybody. Yeah, it made them say, and then and then Eric and Dave Mason and George go and join up with Delaney and Bonnie. They want a piece of this mm. thing that the band and that and they start finding this route that they missed because all they concentrated on was the blues, you know, and that country part of it wasn't really so significant uh, till the brand, the band bought their brand of rock and roll with Bob Dylan of all people who everybody respected and, mm. and nobody was better than it blew everybody's mind, man. I mean, they had that, the bootleg, I've talked to Kat, say we had that record, you know, that Great White Wonder. It was, uh, it was a bootleg of, uh, you know, the basement tapes. The ba- yeah, and yeah. They played it and played it and played it. They did. It was unbelievable to them, uh, you know, and, and it changed music. So the band was key to me meeting those guys and playing with those guys was uh, it sort of fell into my lap from my working with John Sebastian in Woodstock and, and him. And then I got a place up there and John said, you know, you lived – you could throw a rock through the trees behind your house and hit Levon's place. Why don't we go over there? So we go over there and we get to the porch and there's 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 bot- Coke bottles, okay? Those little green Coke bottles. Sure. Stacked up on the porch. I mean, like eight feet high, covering the whole porch. And Levon had he's you know he's going to cash them in one day. You know? <laughs> <laughs> this is before the ramble. And then I just got to be friends with him, and and uh, we went up there to do a thing for Happy Traum for Johnny Johnson. We did a uh, you know one of those instructional videos that Happy had on Homespun. Oh yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And the Traum brothers played with Bob. You know, Happy and Artie were mm. famous up there for, yep. for being with Bob Dylan, and uh, and great, great, great people. So we were doing that with Johnny, and Levon had just come back from his first day of uh, chemo on or radiation rather yeah. on his throat. And Amy was with him, driving him, his daughter, who's really got a great career of her own right now. Yeah. You know, she's really talented. And she said, Jimmy, Levon wants to come in. And I, he doesn't, you know, I, I don't want him to. And she said he's, he had aloe, put this aloe on his throat. It was like red. And it was steam was coming off me. He just had had this like radiation treatment. He wanted to meet Johnny Johnson. He didn't care that he just, you know, was sick or whatever. And he came in, he just was all over the place, shaking hands with John, loving Johnny. He goes, Jimmy V, what you ought to do? And he just called me Jimmy V because the name Vivino is not in the Arkansas. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Home book at all. I feel so, you, man. <laughs> Jimmy V worked fine. So I got my nickname. And when a gang nicknames you, by the way, that you're in. That's it. Yeah, yeah. So so he said, You ought to bring Johnny over to the you ought to bring Johnny over to the barn and record him. You know, I'll come and play and we'll call everybody up. And and we did. And that was, and then Levon said to me, "Man, this is the first time me and Rick and Garth and actually, you know, uh, Weeder and, and Randy, we actually tracked together. The last three records we made, we, we didn't. We came in separate. You know, it was that whole thing where they couldn't get them all at one time. And sure. and they played when they played together, man. And it, nothing, not there's nothing, no feeling like that. Those guys playing uh, the way they just played, and they don't think about it. And um, so then that that turned that morphed into uh, a band called the Barn Burners mm-hmm. with Lee Mon and uh, and uh, and then that finally he said I don't want to go out and do it do this anymore I want to stay home let's do the Midnight Ramble like we used to do in Arkansas and have the people come to my house brilliant idea so that's when that, that's yeah. how that started so then ten years that last ten years and uh, and it might have been Dave Marsh that said 
I don't want to misquote if it was Dave Marsh or Bill Flanagan, two writer friends of mine that, that rock and roll writers. Yeah, very, you're very bringing up some old names, that, man. You're, yeah, one of them. Is... One of them had the greatest quote, and I guess I guess as Yogi Berra said, you could look it up. Who said it? But he said this was the <laughs> greatest <laughs> encore in the music business. This last ten years of Levon Helms' life was yeah. was the greatest encore because he won three Grammys in that time, and the band had none. Because they may have been pre Grammy, you know. Yeah, yeah, that eligible. was. <laughs> they weren't on the radar yeah. screen. Yeah, that album he did was. For that, them, you know. That yeah. last album he and did. And they was were gone already uh, before it became a real, a real, a big, a big thing, you know. But um, uh, so, so that was that's just a little piece of, of, uh, you know, meeting people, and we still talk about the band, and and everybody still talks about Levon, and, and everybody still talks about Hubert, and I, and and it was. On a gig, I had put this band together with Hubert uh, and and Levon and David Johansson singing my my brilliant idea. To, I said, "Who do I know? Which one of my friends?" And I know David as a, you know. People may not think he's the New York Dolls or he's Buster Poindexter, but he's a music. He's a guy with like more forty fives and more music knowledge than than anybody except that I ever knew, except for Joey Ramone, who had even more records. Joey wow. Ramone was even had even more depth and in, uh, in music, you know he because he was one of those nerdy kids that stayed at home with his record collection. Is you know, he, he a New York cat? He, Joe yeah, Hansen? yeah. Or okay. they're all Queen. Yeah, yeah. He's he's a Staten Island guy. That's you know that's him funny. and Chasm. Chasm. And, yeah, I interviewed Chasm from yeah. Chasm and also Earl Slick. They're, yeah. they're they're Staten Island guys. So Joe Hansen was the perfect choice because he loved Wolf and he has that he has that stage presence even though he's a skinny little guy, you know? So that's when Levon, we were playing at BB Kings, the departed club from New York, which mm. is now gone. And, uh, and Levon said, I think I'll sing one after, after not singing for like many years. Uh, and he started singing. And then after that, we put the ramble together when he, he started singing again. Uh, that's just, um, a little piece, a little slice of the, some recent history that, uh, that's still with me every day. Those guys, Johnny Johnson, Levon Helm, Hubert Sumlin, uh, they, they were family. Those guys were, you know, they were family to me. And uh, I took away more than I did from high school or college or anything I ever did from those guys. And, and a couple other and, – and there's other people I worked with that, that were I, – I only ever worked with one true artist – Okay, and that would be Laura Nero, who was a true genius. Uh, everyone else was a musician. Yeah. Uh, Laura was not. She was just uh, before the song singer songwriter existed. You know, she was doing that in 1968 when she came out as a 16 year old kid, and before Carol King and Carly and all the singer songwriters. You know, Laura was just a person, a kid from the Bronx. You know, that just. You know, she was a doo-wop freak. She she sang, she sang with the boys in the hallway, you know, with, with guys like Dion and them. You know, I mean, those were her heroes. Uh, you know, the jesters, the wind. The, it was just about uh, songs and harmony, her whole thing. Uh, natural piano player. I don't think she knew what a note was. She couldn't she call just, it. You know, and that's, that's, that's the, amazing. The best musicians, I think the best musicians aren't hung up on with what it's called. You yeah, know? yeah. I remember doing. I remember a funny story. Doing something with Hank Williams uh, Jr. was 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 playing with Hank Williams Jr. and uh, and somebody. You know, we're trying to figure. You know, we're doing organically figuring it out. You know, and somebody scholarly, maybe the piano player in the band, says, "Oh, well, that's a that's a G seven flat five actually." And then Hank says, "I don't know what you call it, but that ain't it." <laughs> See, because the ear doesn't get fooled. Mm. by that you know james brown used to say don't play no college chords yeah you know what a so, what a what a performer james brown yeah, was yeah and, and a guy Lord. that could deconstruct a groove and uh you know i did have that one time well the first time i worked with him was uh <laughs> well let me talk about the second time first because it's a quicker story and then go back to when i when i first met james brown i uh you know he was coming on the show and we were gonna we were going to bring him on and he was there with his band. He was there with, with you know, his band was going to play, but Danny Ray was with him. Now, Danny Ray is the guy who said, Mr. Danny Mike Cord, ah, Mr. Please, please, please Cord. So we were going to rehearse James's intro 
which my band was going to play. And then, then we we're going to, then he was going to come out. So we we're rehearsing with Danny Ray in, in this little tiny rehearsal room. And James Brown comes in, he walks in the room. Unbelievable. He walks in and then he takes everybody's instrument and he can't play a note on them, but the groove coming out of him, <laughs> just hitting the bass, like play like this, you know, and the guitar, like, just like, with his right hand, I, and I said, it's all there. He he can play some piano. You know, that's about all, mm. and drums. He can play piano and drums. But everything else, and it's that funny scene, and, and it might sound cliche and corny, and but there's a scene in that Mr. Dynamite movie where he <laughs> says everything's a drum, you know, that famous <laughs> scene. But that's true. I was in that situation where he walked in because he played everything. He didn't say those words. But he played everything like it was a drum. He pick up the bass and just like with his right hand, you you the groove would be coming out. You go, wow, you know, he's got something uh, music running through him that he yeah. can't help get out. And so that was that was great. And this was after this was later in his career. But earlier, I had worked with when I start, started working with Felix Cavallari, um, who's just a hero of mine because the Rascals. I worked with Eddie and Felix and Gene and. You know, and all of them in different bands together, and uh, and you know, Felix was my hero along with Al Cooper and Steve Winwood because they were organ players, as I was up until I was twenty three. So um, when I was working, um, let me see, I was working with Felix. There was a guy named Joel Gallen who later who who was our road manager, and Joel Gallen later uh, sort of. You know, MTV Unplugged was his baby. You know, down the road, he had become really successful as a producer. But after we stopped working, both stopped working with Felix, I talked to him on the phone and he started doing things around L.A., you know, and I said, listen, if anything ever comes up with James Brown, call me, man. I will carry water. I'll carry guitar cases. I just want to be around. I just want to meet James Brown because he was the one when you say, is there anyone that you, you know, were in awe of? you know, awestruck by, I have to say that he would be the one. He would be just the a soul, even above B.B. King and above players. It was James Brown. Um, having collected every record I could find and read everything I could about him and uh, and just uh, got so much from it musically from him. So Joel calls me one day and says, listen, I got this idea with Sid Vintage. We're putting out a, a video uh, for, for VH1. It's a soul, a, a Cinemax rather for Cinemax. He goes, it's a Cinemax soul session with James Brown. Okay, James Brown is going to be the host of this show. Uh, we're going to film it in Detroit at a little club because Aretha won't get on a plane. He goes, Wilson Pickett's coming up a day before <laughs> because, and we're going to we're going to sneak him in and record him on Friday. <laughs> and I said, what's that about? He says, well, the marshals are looking for him up there. <laughs> for, for what? Divorce case. Oh. Um, alimony payment. Yeah, yeah. He says, so he's got to come in. Look, call him at the hotel. His name is like, uh, you know, Jose Lafarge or something. <laughs> he's staying. He's, you got to talk. Just just discuss the music with Wilson Pickett. I said, well, that alone. Yeah. That's enough. He said, Joe Cocker's going to be on it. And uh, at the time, Robert Palmer is going to be on it. What year was this? And, oh, it's in the it's in the 80s sometime. Billy Vera had a big song. Billy and the Beaters were out. I interviewed so Billy. So Billy was on the show. Great guy. And Aretha, right? And Aretha <laughs> and James Brown, Mr. Brown, Mr. Brown now. Uh, he says, "I want this is what I want. I need you to do. He says, not carry guitar cases or water. He goes, I'll get you to Detroit. I'll, I'll get you to Detroit. I'll get you a hotel room. You'll be up there for like five days. I'll pay you $500. And I want you to do some arrangements and rehearse James Brown's band because they have to back everybody up. Wow. And anything they're not, you know, used to playing, you're going to have to work with, with, uh, you know, there's Charles Shirell, who was James's, uh, music director. Well, Maceo was there too, but Charles was now the, the, the music director. And I knew Charles Shirell as the bass player. You know, he was the bass player on, on the hell album. You know, and I'm like, wow. Oh, yeah. Well, he graduated from bass. He doesn't have to play bass now. He gets like a clavinet now <laughs> and he gets to lead the band. So he's moved up, you know. Um, so we get there 
and I have to get together with Cocker. You know, we got to figure out he's going to do when a man loves a woman. So Joe says, meet me in the in the hotel bar. There's a piano there, <laughs> you know. So it didn't go in that order. First, it's the bar, then the piano. Yeah, I was thinking so, that. Yeah, and 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 not we didn't get crazy, but we had a couple of drinks. It was great hanging with him, and he's beautiful. You know, he's a guy that is is a fan of everything American musically. You know, so he was really thrilled and and felt really a little bit. Wow, this is great! I'm not, and, and I'm going to sing something I never sang before because hmm. he could own anything. So we go in with the hotel bar now, and, and this is part of this same James Brown story, by the way, folks. If you stay <laughs> with us, uh, and I'm playing "When a Man Loves a Woman" on the piano, and we start in C, then we get up to D flat. We keep looking for a key. I said, Joe, how are we going to know when we get to the right key? Uh, you can sing it in all these keys, and he goes, Well, there's a spot in my throat over here, and when it hurts, I know we're in the right key. <laughs> <laughs> there's there is some pain involved in this delivery, man. You know? Everybody's got and a, he was, a system. Yeah, Robert Palmer was easy. I had worked with him. Uh, I worked with him again later, rather, but I had I was a big fan of Robert Palmer's, and he was going to do "Addicted to Love" and and "Out of Sight" or something, uh, or I don't know. Anyway, everyone's job was to do a song with James Brown's band, and then a song with James Brown. That's how this this mm. was going to happen. So I had to teach all this music like to the to their band and. And that and it was cool. Even Aretha, you know, Aretha was going to sing. James was going to sing It's a Man's World. And Aretha walked out and sang Do Right Woman at him. He at him. She he was that he was she buried him, man. <laughs> you know, and Wilson Pickett singing Cold Sweat with James Brown was a first, you know, those two together. So that was easy. James's stuff was easy. But having to teach the stuff to his band was that process again of. Yeah, I wrote charts and I gave them to when I went over the horn charts with Maceo, which was just thrilling, you know, to to work with him on that. And uh, and and James Brown had, had two drummers, you know, we had two drummers up there. So we're working out "Addicted to Love," and I got one playing one part, and I the other guy play another part, and, and then somebody taps me on the sh- shoulder and says, "Mr. Brown wants to speak to you." And I and I turned around and, and there he is, you know, and I hadn't seen him, met him at all. He wasn't around. He wasn't on the set for two days. And he showed up at the rehearsal and he's just standing there. And he's not a big guy, but no. he still appears like eight feet tall. I and mean, he's just like bigger than life, you know. Sure. And there he is. Cool. As shit. He's all his hair is perfect. You know, he's got like a scarf tied around his neck and a sharp and a dressed dude. Suit. It's green. Everything's green. And his boots are like this orange color kind of just gold watches and shit you know looking great man just just and he just and i had to lean down to him and he said i'm not tall i had to lean down he goes uh how come you got two drummers playing i said because you have two drummers i i figured we could use them it would be great he goes no when one gets tired the other one picks it up (laughs) i said really they don't play at the same time he goes no (laughs) he says but he said and i'm like now what do i do he says but I'll let you do that. It sounds good. Uh, okay. With this. She says, not gonna, you're, not, you're not messing with my music. I said, no, I'm not messing with your music. I said, I'm just, uh, you know, and I didn't want, he wanted to choose my words correct. Oh, yeah, yeah. I did not want to say the word teach about him to his band. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I said, I'm just hipping your cats to what's going on with this other music. You know? And he said, yeah, well, they're pretty hip. I said, yeah. I said, yeah, I'm just making sure that my chart works. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Holy crap. He says, well, he says, well, he says something like, well, well, don't worry if it doesn't, they'll fix it. You know, <laughs> so <laughs> so uh, he didn't get involved beyond saying, why are you using two drummers? Which was brilliant, I thought, for him to even question me, you know, and, and to let me go. That was and, cool. Uh, it was very cool. And then uh, meeting him down the road, he remembered, you know, when I met him the next time, you know, and uh, and between these times, he had gotten some trouble, you know. And, uh, you could and, say and that you could re- pick any two periods and you'd be able to say that. Yeah. Well, this was before <laughs> this was before the shotgun and pickup truck uh, incident. You know, yeah. where he got pulled away for some kind of crap. You know, uh, after all, he was he was Mr. Dynamite. That's know? right. <laughs> and uh, so and the thing that struck me and this is just a uh, you know, this is just an image I'll never forget at up at 6A in, in Rockefeller Center. We had dressing rooms. Man, if you if you've ever been in a prison cell, 
the dressing rooms are the same size as a prison cell. Oh, wow. And, and James Brown, from when he got there that day, sat outside of his dressing room in a chair, would not go. He would not go in there and close the door. He I think he was the confined space was like a, a memory. And I'm just riffing on this. Yeah, yeah, this yeah. It might not be true at all. But this is my just, you know, my romanticizing James Brown's life in my own head. Because I try to be observant about things. So why is James Brown, when like Elton John or somebody comes, they close the door, they got a security guy, Jerry Lee Lewis, like you can't, you have to knock on the door, can I say hello to Mr. Lewis? And he turns, sitting in that little room, you know, that confined space. James Brown sat the whole day, I mean, from 10 o'clock in the morning till 6 o'clock at night. Just sat in out hallway, in a chair. Out in that hallway, yeah. And he, wow. and it was personable and pictures with everybody and this is before even before everyone had an iphone sure so you sure. had to you had to work to get a picture yeah yeah get yeah Emma. but i but i and and you know people could say what they want that oh that's that's wrong of you to say that but that's what's my impression yeah. my impression was that he does not want to be in that little room you know he wants to be out in the open and and so he therefore even with all of his History and story, you know, he's this way or that way, was one of the nicest people uh, ever. And um, he had, he seemed to be, he wasn't bitter about anything, you know, and the music saved him again every yeah. time. It saved, you know, God kept throwing him back, like they used to say about Richard Manuel, you know, yeah. he keeps trying to leave and God keeps throwing him back. That's what Levon used to say about Richard, you know. Uh, so, uh, yeah, that was the one moment of working uh, up there. Besides Al Green, BB King, you know, by, meeting Bonnie Raitt up there, and uh, and she and finding out that she was just the biggest champion of the blues. You know, just if Ruth Brown was going to be there, Bonnie was going to get on a plane and play with Ruth Brown. You know, uh, she was going to use every moment to hang with her heroes that she could. Um, and and I really respected that about her and and. She went the extra distance. This is when the blue, all those blues foundations were all new ideas, and she was very at the forefront of promoting, you know, health care for these people that uh, that really, you know, didn't have any kind of support system. Um, so that blues foundation is great for that. I Barbara Newman over there, and and those people, they they just they have a love for the the musicians and the music and. Uh, that whole Memphis, you go to Memphis and it's like the air there, Memphis, New Orleans, certain places where music was, our music was, uh, you know, really, gro really grown from. And I always had that, uh, w you know, those conversations with my friends about the regions and the rhythm sections. You know, the meters were in New Orleans, yeah. uh, you know, the, the Booker T and the MGs were in Memphis. You know, the Stax guys were down there, you know, and the, and the Muscle Shoals guys Muscle were in Shoals, Alabama, yeah. you know, and and New York. We had a whole bunch of uh, New York, Chicago, New York. I can't even get into because there's so many people. But then there was the Wrecking Crew out in L.A. There was the Funk Brothers up in Detroit. They didn't even have names back then. They were just working musicians. Uh, in, in, in there was guys like Lewis Satterfield and Morris Jennings in Chicago and and, uh, you know, making records, Phil Upchurch. These names to me, Mickey Baker in New York, they were more important than the than the people who were the stars on the records. Hmm. So my life was about arranging always, because being a, starting as a trumpet player and and having horn bands when I was ten years old, you know, and writing charts and reading books how to write charts and just taking down off of records. My life was always about deconstructing those records and finding out what was in them, and not until. Did I meet somebody like myself until I met Paul Schaefer, who was just like me, but from Canada? And uh, and he taught me. We worked on a on a, an off Broadway show together, uh, and it was the music of Phil Spector. Ellie uh, uh, Ellie Greenwich worked. It was her life, Jeff Barry and Ellie Greenwich, and it was called Leader of the Pack. And it was about all the songs that they wrote in that girl group era, and worked with Phil Spector. So Paul and I worked on that show together. That was when I first met Paul. What year is this? And, oh, it's in the. It might be Jesus. When did Letterman start? It's. It, 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 did it start in eighty one? Was this like eighty one? Is that what it was? It was eighty one or eighty two. I, I think. Uh, I can't. I can't remember. Uh, I don't have my. I don't know. Anyway, 
I, I'm saying it was in the eighties. Letterman was pretty new. It was like two years in. When did Saturday Night Live start? Seventy six. Oh, that was in the seventies. I don't know what year, but yeah, it was like seventy six or five seventy six. So this is probably this has got to be eighty two. I'm gonna guess. All right, and uh, and then we started working together, and he. He was hired as music director, and I was hired as a ranger. You know, I had to pass a, I had to pass a test, uh, a pass a test with Paul. I had to go visit him at the Gramercy Park Hotel, and bring some charts for him to look at. Hmm. Look at some charts, and and I, and I get up there, and he's sitting on a cat, and he lived in the Gramercy Park Hotel. You know, he had this this other. He also had the romanticized notion of New York, being from Thunder Bay, Canada, that he was going to come down like Duke Ellington and live in a hotel. Oh, yeah. And, so he lived in the Gramercy Park, which was a huge rock and roll hotel. They don't have you know? they don't have that hotel anymore. It's that's not around. I no, there's probably condos or something, yeah, you know. Yeah. But but he lived in a hotel, and it was so great. And I walked up there, and I, and, and I walk in the door, and of course it's a piano with just stuff all over it, music tapes. Then it was about cassettes everywhere, yeah. you know. And and there was this couch, and he's sitting on the couch with Harry Shearer, you know, and <laughs> they're buddies from Canada, you know, they're just old buddies. And he's going to, so he looks at my charts and he said, yeah, they're, yeah, they're fine. He, he says, I don't do horn charts. So yeah, you're hired. <laughs> we talked about Phil Spector for about 10 minutes and we were in. So yeah. we, we went down that rabbit hole, you know, and Harry, I didn't know was such a mu- musicologist too. And we found out later, you know, with Spinal Tap and with Mighty Wind, how, how deep Harry was into music. Um, so uh, Paul told me about the rhythm section. He said, if you get, if you listen to an old record, you build it from the bottom up. He goes, I know you're a string and horn arranger and everything. And you hear things from the top. You hear the vocal, you hear the horns. You hear the... But if you listen to a record from the bottom up, and if you get the bass and drums right when you're recreating the record live, you've got it. Because everything else will fall into place. And that's the main thing. And I wasn't yet writing out bass lines, you know. And for, for and then I realized that, gee, you know, if you don't have guys that are going to do the homework and learn it exactly right, uh, you're going to end up with just an, just like a, a just a wedding band version of it. So trusting the musicians wasn't always the best thing. But when you had guys like Will Lee, who did yeah. the homework, you know, and you had guys like uh, this guy, Leo Adamian, that we had on drums or Anton Fig, you know, or at the time, Steve Jordan. They were like us. We had this little club that was like the record, the record. Listen to the record. You know, Steve Jordan is still like he's still the best at assimilating that Al, Al Jackson thing. You know what it is. He took it apart. He explained it to me. It's about, you know, it's about pushing the, the two and back on the four, you know, and just just things that guys. There were guys like me out there. I found that I'm so enamored. These records are our uh, Bibles, man. You know, this is our. This is our college. These are our education. And and all of them became great producers and sing and, and, and songwriters and players because they put in the hours on what was it about those records that made them so great. And I think it, it works. Um, you know, it, it's how Paul Schaefer never hired me to be a guitar player in his band on Letterman, because when I did get the gig up at Conan and I was all of a sudden in his old office, and we moved the old piano. I remember going to visit him there many times. This old piano we had to move out. It was broken down, and there was just, there was roaches everywhere. And I don't mean the bugs. <laughs> there were just little I hear unfinished you. joints laying on the ground. And I said, "Oh yeah, I remember this place, man. This is great." This we should, I should, I wanted to keep the piano, but there was like I told you, there were prison cell size, you know, uh, dressing rooms. And uh, and Paul said to me, "Well, I I never, you know, I never." hired you for my band because first of all, I couldn't have two band leaders in the band. And I always knew you'd end up doing something better than just playing for me, you know? So that was, that's nice. cool, man. Yeah. And, and you know, how, I, how did you, how did you get the gig at Conan? Well, Max got the gig. I was in Sausalito living with Clarence and we had a band, you know, in Marin County that we had, we had Clarence's band and, uh, it's Clarence, and, <laughs> Clarence Clemens. Clemens. Yeah, okay. So I thought, yep. You know, the Jersey Mafia, we all know each other. We yep. all, we just, over the years, we've all met, and I'd played with Max, and Max and I had a band. We produced a record together, and uh, Killer Joe, it was like a horn band, and very jump blues kind of a thing. And it, we, we did some gigs, and then it kind of fizzled out. This is post, 
I guess uh, Tunnel of Love when when Bruce dismissed yeah. his family <laughs> and then got him back together later, realizing that his sound was really coming from him and his band. I yeah. think anyway. That's just a, a that's an aside about about me and and knowing that th- that's a great band, you know, and that and that when it works like that, great. The, the it's all of the players in that band that made it great. So I was off with Clarence and Sausalito. Yeah, and I got a phone call from Max, and there was there was no cell phones now. Okay, I couldn't get a private phone call. I got a phone call where Clarence answers the phone. Jimmy, it's Max. What's happening, man? <laughs> he says, "Here, he wants to talk to you." I said, "Really? Hey, Max. You know, I'm talking." It's Max Weinberg you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And Max says, "Well, who else?" Right? <laughs> no, I'm just, in case a listener, yeah. someone in the listener doesn't know. Oh, you kids! Yeah, it's Max Weinberg. Look <laughs> up. It's, uh, Yogi again. You could look it up. Uh, uh, so uh, Max says to me uh, quietly, "Listen, I got cooking over here in New York. Don't tell Clarence. Don't tell him because if Clarence knows about it. All he has to do is make a phone call, and he'll get the gig." He's st- and I said, "Yeah, because I know he's that. His presence is that powerful, you know." And it's we're talking television now. He said, "I," he says, "I kind of I saw this guy on Charlie Rose that just got the the late night gig." <laughs> and knowing, I, I I love Max because he happened to run into Conan. God knows I could see Max camped out on the corner outside of NBC waiting <laughs> for this guy to leave the building. That's great because he's a, because he's a mocker, as we say in the business. You know, he's a mover and a shaker. That's so he's, funny. He, he he knows he knows he's a, he knows the business. I happened to run into so, him while I was camping out on the sidewalk, waiting for him. That kind of thing. <laughs> well, I happen to run into him. Well, I'm thinking again. I fantasize in my mind. What's the real situation? Here? Yeah, it's like the James Brown thing again. You know, I, I deconstruct de- 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 the situation. Okay, you ran into him. Yeah, owner of of Sixth Avenue and Forty Ninth Street. Okay, that's right outside of NBC. So anyway, everybody's glad to meet Max. He was a famous guy, you know. So so Max got us an audition. And he said, "You got to come home. We got to put the band back together. It's almost like Blues Brothers here. We got to. We got to put said, the okay, band well, back." I have. He goes, "Who should we use?" I said, "Well, I have the the Vivino Brothers band. Really, me and my brother, and Mike Merritt on bass, you know, and uh, and Scott Healy on keyboards. I guess you'll be playing drums. So that's uh, that's five. And he goes, "Yeah, and and and, and we should get Pender and Labamba from the Jukes, you know, and, trumpet and, and trombone." And why didn't he yeah. he want Clarence involved? You, Clarence is the. You can't be the leader with Clarence in the band. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> you know, no. I mean, Clarence is bigger than life on stage. Okay. You know, and he's the most personable cat I ever met. You know. Okay. Just, you know, it, Clarence wouldn't be involved a because of you know. I mean, just if you think about it, the history is that these guys are scattered now. You know, out of the E Street band. Mm-hmm. So the so the they're not inclined to work together. You know, if they're not in that situation. Okay, because that's that's it. Almost, it's almost like that's it's it, it has a life of its own, and you know, you sure they meet up. It's almost like when the Beatles break up, they don't start working together right away. You know, some of them all of a sudden you see Ringo appearing on people's records. You know? Yeah, you don't see, and and uh, so and Max got the gig, so he's you know he's going to control this thing, you know, and and he can't control it really. If you have a personality that huge with Clarence, in your head okay, yeah, as Clarence, so and and so we're and we're going in a different direction anyway. We're going total jump blues, like you know, total like uh, Louis Prima kind of you know weird different way we're going. And this is Max's you know his his vision of, of what we should do because we had just come out of this thing with a band Killer Joe playing playing you know like small band territory band kind of stuff post war late forties, early fifties swing. And that was big then in 90, in the, in the, in the early nineties, that was kind of jumping big, bad voodoo daddies. No yeah. I remember band. them. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It was all that, you know? Um, so, so then he, uh, he says, let's get together. We'll rehearse. And, we, and, you know, we rehearse, we didn't just rehearse some songs. We put a little mini set, you know, did you say you had, a, did you have to gig. move back to the East coast at that time? Or you just kind of yeah, like, yeah. Yeah, I was in flux anyway. I wasn't sure where I was going to live, you know. So that's why I was living, you know, just like on the wherever, whoever's house I could stay at. Sure. But came back and we. <laughs> and how did we, you? How did you deflect Clarence to the whole thing? Like, what did you tell him? He didn't. He didn't care. 
He didn't care. He just said, I, you know, I got to more of it. Clarence didn't care. He was doing his thing. Okay. You know, Clarence is like, you know, you know, the, the only other guy I know like Clarence in my life is slash. He's bigger than life outside of the situation. Okay. You know, he's, he's, he's key to the situation, be it guns and roses or whatever he's doing. Uh, you know, he's secure enough. And Clarence was too. Okay. You know, he might not necessarily even wanted that. He so it was more of, okay. It was more of a big deal to Max like, than it was Clarence. A little bit more of Max is like, I'm, don't tell him. Yeah, okay. Because you know, I don't want to lose this opportunity. Okay. And, and and it was about it was about really we're being hush hush about this anyway. Right. Don't tell anybody, you know. But I just found it funny that yeah, I, that Clarence would could you know if you, if you think about it, you sit down and go, yeah, this guy could make a phone call, and they say we can get Clarence Clements. Boom, it's done. Wow. Because you know, he's the guy that was singled out because Bruce. Put him on the cover of Born to Run with him. Sure. So, so that was like huge. Uh, that that's iconic. All right. Yeah. So here's an iconic figure, um, and one of the sweetest guys. I mean, we just got to be friends like right away. You know, uh, working with him was was always a pleasure. Anyway, then <laughs> so we go and we we do the audition, and then a funny thing happens. We're at the audition, and the, the executive producer Jeff Ross. No relation to Diana Ross, but was Diana <laughs> Ross's no relation, but was Diana Ross's road manager. No, okay. and not the Jeff Ross comedian guy, right? No, and not him yeah, because okay. he lived in the same building as me in New York. So That's so not funny. The, the, not Jeffrey Ross, the Jeffrey Ross, yeah, yeah. Of, uh, a dear friend and funny That's guy. Funniest, yeah, he's funny. Uh, and can slay anybody at a you know at a roast like he's the he's the king roaster man. Yeah. Uh, and anyway, um, so Jeff Ross, who's the and who actually produced kids in the hall, you know, and he was like a TV, one of Lauren Michaels friends from, mm -hmm. you know, from the old days, he was going to be executive producer, but he was the road manager for Diana Ross in the eighties. And two of our guys, the last two we got from the Jukes, Pender and LaBamba were in Diana Ross's band. While Jeff Ross for managing that live tour. So you're uh, thinking that's so a really knew, good sign. Well, we said, well, that's a good sign because it was like people are hugging before we even play it, though. Yeah. And I'm like, well, well, that's good because as we and here we go. I know there's kids sitting in the practice room that are playing their asses off, you know, and are playing so much shit. But do they know how to work? Do they know how to play the game? You know, because there is a game uh, uh, for working. Um, it's first of all, playing the gig, playing what the gig requires, not what you've learned, you know. So you can't get in, you know. We can't just because you're a great player and have a lot of chops and technique doesn't mean you're going to get the gig if you sure. if you play your your thing rather than what the gig requires. So always knowing what the gig requires is important. And part of what it requires is relationships don't hurt. You know, oh hell yeah! The way. So yeah, the the door the oper the door. You know, there's a door for opportunity, a big door, but then there's this little dog door on the bottom. That some people go through yeah. because they, we got a way in sometimes. It didn't mean we were going to get the gig. Everybody wasn't for us having the gig. Uh, you know, John Lurie's band Lounge Lizards were up for it, too. There were about 15 bands in New York that had auditioned for this. Oh, one wow. Tiny gem of a gig. Uh, I think we got it based on, you know, Max's determination, you know, and putting a show together and bringing our own lights in. And bring, like he's doing like a like a large large rock band uh, you know tour in a little tiny studio you know and we put a, we put a medley together of stuff you know all kinds of fun swinging and and rocking energy you know for TV uh, we weren't trying to be too cool for the room so uh, it worked Conan liked one particular thing we did he was shy kind of in the corner. You know, I didn't know he, yet that he was a guitar freak and a rockabilly freak and, uh, you know, and uh, and that we would become guitar buddies. You know, mm. I didn't know then. Uh, there's a lot we didn't know. And uh, and the fact that some of the guys knew some of the people involved, it didn't hurt. Yeah, I say. it didn't hurt because people always say, I can't believe I, I don't know why I didn't get that gig. I thought I was good. You know, well, everybody's good. Everybody yeah. try everybody, you know. No, but that thing, it a lot of it, I would bet, not just the relationships, but when you put that kind of extra effort in 
that has nothing to do with music and everything to do with like amping the Reason energy it. and presentation, yeah. that is fucking yeah. really important because somebody who goes, you know, how you do one thing is how you do everything. And if you're the kind of person that puts that much energy and effort into that, well, he's sitting there thinking he's going to do this. Exactly. You know? but you see, that's, that's Max. That's not me. I, I don't, you know, I, I learned that. The, the little bit I know about that, you know, I learned from from that situation. Yeah. That, okay, so presentation. You know, you're learning all the all along. I, I, you know, and, Every day, man. And you might – and somebody might say something about someone as a player, but you may say, well, that doesn't matter because, you know, for Tommy Tedesco, the great Tommy Tedesco, who's guitar a guitar player, player yeah. for Wrecking Crew. Sure. And if you saw the Wrecking Crew movie, you get an idea who Tommy was. Absolutely. He had this book that I got when I – you know, when I was in – New York, and, and I was, when I when I decided that I wanted to play guitar, I wanted to start doing sessions. I I, I started taking lessons uh, on guitar when I was like twenty two, something like that. You know, I'd moved over from trumpet and B three and whatever else I was doing to. So you've only been playing guitar. guitar for ten years. Well, <laughs> yeah, yeah, what year is it? Yeah, yeah. I, well, actually, you know, You're now it's 40, 32. Like forty years or something. <laughs> it's forty years now. You know, so. But but back Who then did you it take was, lessons I, from? I started getting books because you could get these method books and things and and I had this great Tommy Tedesco book that I tre- I I treasured it. Uh, first thing he says is take the gig and then learn how to do it. <laughs> he says because the guy hiring you doesn't know how yeah, to do it. Right. All right. And and you probably do even though you think you don't know how to do it. And then he had this great section where he 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 took every stringed instrument. And taught you how to string it like a guitar. So if somebody says, can you play the lute? You say, yes. Yeah. You go, you get yourself the cheapest lute you can find. And string it like this, like a guitar. And oh. then just play it. Or a balalaika, yes. You take the three strings and do it like like E, B, and G. And you learn to play. And then you can play your those you know D position chords and the three, three note you know bar chord, little banjo chords. You can learn to play. And uh, and mandolin he had a tuning for mandolin that worked for guitar players and this is he a tommy had, tedesco know, book t- yeah tommy tedesco's book about how to tune these exotic instruments because he was doing movie dates sure. and the, here's a funny story about him when they had called uh for the for the um you know the soundtrack to dr Shivago. they had called in some real russian balalaika players and they got the guys in and they couldn't read anything the composer's like, well, they can't, and then they can't read Lara's theme. Bum, bum, somewhere, my love, you know that that. Da, 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 and they and they they could only play the Russian folk music they knew. They weren't like studio music. Studio guys, yeah, yeah. So they called Tommy. Hey, can you play ballet like a sure? He goes down. There was a little. There was a little store in Hollywood and Vine. That sold exotic, crappy versions of everything, and he bought himself a balalaika, tuned it up with three guitar strings, came in, and he's all over the soundtrack playing balalaika, you know, because he what said, "What a great lesson, man." The guy, he's just the the contractor doesn't play balalaika. He doesn't know how it's tuned. He knows if it sounds like the instrument. Yeah. that's what you want, you know. And and that was that was brilliant. That was a spark that went off. I said, "Take the gig." Take the gig. The worst that can happen is somebody they'll, they'll replace you. Yeah, you know, you're no you worse. You get the experience of failing at the gig, yeah. you know. Yeah. But your name is out there again, and and you you know. And look, if you look at guys that have, if you were afraid to do everything, nobody there'd be no guitar players on a Steely Dan record. Yeah, because, <laughs> because the stories, and I know a lot of those guys now are friends of mine, and Donald and Walter are. Fr- well, God bless Walter. We yeah. lost him, but. They became really good friends of mine, you know, and 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 curious for bringing twelve guys in to play yeah. a solo like Peg, you know. Finally, Jay Graydon gets it. Yeah. But the list of guys left in the wake of that song is incredible. Now, they shouldn't feel bad that they didn't get on there, you mm-hmm. know, because this was almost like, um, you know, there's a there was a great a great little rascals. Uh, it was a great little rass. I'll go back to the my old childhood youth, where where, where uh, they're looking. It might be Stymie. He's looking. He's looking. His mother sent him to the store for something. He didn't know what it was, so he's tasting everything on the shelf. <laughs> that ain't it. That ain't it. 
that ain't it. But finally, when it came, it's this is the old this is the old Hank Williams Jr. thing again. I don't know what you call it, but that ain't it, you know. Yeah. And then when you hear when Donald and Walter would finally hear it, they had the luxury and the budget back then to bring right. guys in, pay them, use them or not. Look, you got paid whether you make the record or not. You don't even know until it comes out. Sure. You know. So so that's that was part of the old studio uh, method, you know, and a lot of times it'd be the guy like Rick Derringer. You wouldn't expect that would blow them away. You know, that was like, that was such a, you know, that's on like showbiz kids or something, you know? And you're like, Oh, is Rick Derringer on showbiz kids? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I didn't know that. Oh, yeah, so wow. Yeah, well, you know, well, this is how you have to, you have to look at, uh, Look at the liner notes, which we don't get anymore. I, you know what? That's the thing I miss the most because I used to get such an education and learn, and that's not really available. I mean, you got to go out of your way. It's out there, but it's yeah, you know, it's not part of the. Uh, you know, you used to yeah. have you, that was your vesting in the record, yeah. and you know, you'd read it. And, yeah, like you know, when you found out that Denny Diaz played Diaz played that uh, "Do It Again" solo, that's right. so great, you know, and and gold earrings. There's a, there's a on gold, there's an outtake of gold earrings where Denny's playing the solo, and 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 you hear Donald say, "Holy fuck!" <laughs> it's like he was so impressed in the middle of the take, you know that that's that you know though, though I had that record when I started playing guitar, I got that decade of Steely Dan album, mm -hmm. and just like went through it like no, just like learning all those guitar parts and also the parts. That were being played, you know, and and um, I know there was a lot of, you know, there was a lot of oh, that's yacht rock or whatever they call it now, you know. But yeah. that's some of the best music made. Uh, that it, it should not get thrown into a into any kind of category other than brilliant, you know. Uh, yeah, and, those early Steely Dan yeah, all records of those, were phenomenal. All of those man, are so well, so well made. It's and, incredible and, and incredibly witty and funny and. Uh, and uh, you can learn so much about music. Donald's thing was like this triad and a bass note, the moo method of moo chords, where um, when I did work with him and we, uh, you know, we, we got together and, and he would show me some things on the piano and how he wanted things voiced. It was very specific. And he would even write him out for me. And, uh, you know, and in those days, he didn't take a picture of everything and post it. Wow, look, I got this chart from, from Donald Fagan. Fagan. Yeah, me, 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 me. We didn't do that. We just, I don't even know where they are now. They're in mm. my head, you know? Uh, so, and, and I learned a lot and I would say, well, what if you, what would you call that? And he goes, well, you know, really, really said it's, a, you know, it's an A, a triad with a D bass. I said, well, isn't that just a D major nine? He goes, no, because you can't, if I don't want to hear the F sharp in there. I don't want to hear it. I don't, I, you know, I want the three notes and the bass note, you know, don't, don't play anymore, you know, mm. don't, don't add to it. So I learned a lot about, about that really truth, true, truism that, that less is more in that case, mm. you know, you, the space that's involved with that kind of voice. Yeah. And they were, Larry Carlton had re, had, had deconstructed uh, playing triads over these chords, you know, uh, finding, a way to solo. He had even done a thing in Guitar Player magazine about breaking down, you know, his playing playing oh, the triads within the chord uh, into this incredible. You know, he's one of the most lyrical, incredible guitar players that's still rooted in BB King. Hmm. You know, but but um, yeah, me... so those studio guys were my heroes at first. You know, before along with the blues guys and all the guys I heard saw at the Fillmore and heard growing up, and guitar was always in the back of my mind, the thing, you know, and no matter what else I went through, uh, I was going to end up there, I think, on guitar. Let me ask you this. You've been, if, if this is even possible, you've played with so many different people and so many different projects. Tell me your top three musical experiences and why. And, and it could be because of the work you did. It could be the hang. It could be just the magic moment. What would you pick as your top three? Well, Lee, well, Anytime at a ramble with Levon Helm, okay, that's that's probably all three of them. But <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, only because the people that I the, the people that I met through that and the, and the and and the the further furthering of my music education uh, that it it afforded. Uh, Johnny sitting with Johnny Winter playing on on one of his last albums, 
and uh, and and uh, I mean Al Cooper, of course, becoming my best friend after, and that's a great story with Al. You know, after growing up, you know, I regretted never having. I seen Mike Bloomfield play so many times. He was just my number one, Amazing. number one heart. You know, it's what what we how we describe Hubert and 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 Mike was like this too. You know, heart to hand, just leaving the head out of the equation. Uh, phenomenal. You know, just and it's, beautiful. And it's a hard player. thing to do. You know, get out of your head. Where you, you know, you've all been. All the guitar players have been in this situation where you feel like you're standing outside of it and it's happening. You know, and you're not, and it's just you. It's just going by itself. That's the way to get when you get out of your head. You know, and you're singing and not thinking about the notes or the position. Or what, whatever it is, and you just and this is the way Uber played all the time, you know. So it re- truly reflected his mood and and attitude, and he never could, he couldn't, he. Let's see, I'm trying to say he couldn't draw from a well of riffs and say, "Well, I'll just go here," you know. It had to be what was happening in his heart at that moment, uh, and and uh, that's why it was always so reactive. If if the band was good, Hubert was great. If the band wasn't good, then Hubert might not have been so good one night because because to him it's a conversation. And if you're talking with people that you can't communicate with, it's not a good conversation. Yeah. But when it's the right people, it's like it, it's flowing, man. It's like, yeah, 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 I, I was in the same, you know, it's the same, you know, you know they say brothers from another mother and they yeah. say like, you know, we played in different bands together, must have, you know, must have been like in a different life together and you meet those people that you feel like you've known forever. And Hubert is one of those guys. And, and I would have to say that Al Cooper was really important because, uh, I was the super session album when it came out was, was the greatest thing for me because I was an organ player at the time. Oh, that Leslie on there. Uh, And I loved everything Al had done because Al was, and he hates me for saying this, but, he was the Zelig like of the music business. You know, if you know the movie Zelig by Woody Allen, no, tell like me. everything great that happens in history, there's Zelig in the picture. Okay. You know? There he is. There, and he was there too. He was a guy that was able to assimilate himself into a situation and become a part of the fabric of that situation. You know, and it started with the Royal Teens short shorts. And then it went to, to him doing to writing songs. You know, at the at the Brill Building and and on on Broadway, there were all in, and working with and writing with Brass and Levine. You know, writing uh, I, I can't remember what was with Brass actually. They wrote, or maybe anyway, they wrote this Diamond Ring. Okay. You know, for Gary Lewis, he had yeah. a hit. He shows up and he has a hit, and then he goes, he walks, his, he gets a call, you know, from Tom Johnson, who's the Doobie Brothers engineer, producer. He says, okay. Bob Dylan's recording down here at, uh, you know, Columbia. Come on down. He brings his guitar. He just the balls of it. He brings his guitar down. He takes the guitar. He has a jazz master, I guess, then or something. He takes his guitar out, and he plugs it in, and he starts playing. And then Bloomfield walks in with his telly. No case, right? No case. A, co- a coil cord permanently attached, like, you know, the, the input jack is yeah. broken, as it does on all. He's got wires coming out. Just like twisted on to the ends of the cord, you know, and with some some ga- at that time no gaffer tape would have been electrician's tape, you sure. know, like black electrical tape. So the cord is attached. He sits down, he plugs it in, and he starts burning through some shit. And Al quietly walks over and puts his guitar away. You know, <laughs> says, "I'm not playing any." And the takes are starting, and Al gravitates. Paul Griffin was playing B three on the first couple of takes. Uh, I have every take of like a Rolling Stone, every every version that it went through. And then Paul Griffin gets up and he decides to move the piano. Okay, the B3 chair is open. So the, Al, Al goes over there. Goes over there during the take and just starts playing that shit. And and he just played that that stuff one time. All that great stuff we hear. One take. And he says, yeah, and Al says, uh, you hear the way I come in? Once upon a point. Uh, the organ comes in on the, a beat later, constantly. I said, yeah, that's a brilliant part. He goes, no, that's a part that says, what is the chord? Hear it, and then go to it. And that's the way Bob worked anyway. He didn't tell anybody. There was no chart. 
He just played and you and you followed him. He said, so I'm back there. And then during the courses, he played that iconic riff. It's like, wow, it's so iconic. And then they go in the control room and Al's like sitting in the corner just like by himself. And, and Bob comes in and, and he says, turn the organ up. Listen to what the organ, who's that? <laughs> you know, and there's one point in the take when you hear Tom Wilson get on the talk back. When Al goes over to the organ and Tom, like he's laughing, goes, what are you doing over there? <laughs> he says to Al, Al says nothing. And he's OK, you know, take whatever it was. And actually, the final is um, two takes put together. It's wow. two, it's a little bit of two takes because because only, you know, Dylan had a way of uh, from what I can gather from everyone that know that was there um, or or at any point of of if the vocal's good the track is good so you'll hear a mistake now and then you know a bass mistake or something on a track but if the vocal's good that's all that bob was concerned with. was that really you know and wisely i think they needed a line from another one so there's like a couple of bars from another take because he maybe flubbed the vocal line but it wasn't for anything other than the vocal and uh and then i found out later that you know russ savukas on bass not Harvey. It's the one track that Harvey didn't play. So then Al gets the gig to record the rest. Bob loves him. You know, he's bringing to the record what the record needs. Bob didn't sit down and say, OK, play organ for me. Show me your chops, you know, you know, for all those guys yeah. that can play that that study and I can do everything Keith Emerson ever did. Yeah. You know, <laughs> you the thing you can't do is sit down and come up with that arranging head sometimes. Yeah. The right part. It only takes one finger. To play the right part. That's so funny. So, uh, yeah, you put it like that. Yeah, sure it is. Um, it doesn't always work. But granted, you know sometimes it's the opposite thing. You need more. Yeah. But uh, but for Bob it was perfect, and that's where you know Al steps in and and just he becomes so much a part of that record and the next one. No, but what I give him a lot of credit for is most people would see Bloomfield put down their guitar and like. Fuck just up. sit in the control room or, yes. or leave well, and he, you know, that, but he had the, the gumption I learned from Al too because which was yeah, great yeah look even during a ramble like there would be me and larry campbell and sometimes jim weeder or sometimes buddy miller or you know it would be like a lot of people and i would look over and say well brian mitchell's over there he's or alan two saints over there whoever he's playing piano i'll play b3 the b3 chair is open i'll walk over to the b3 and I'll play the B3 because I learned that from Al that, yeah, come up with a little part that works. You know the music yeah. you know, and listen to everything going on. You know, just don't 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 raise your hand. Look at me and start playing some shit. You know, be, play be, right be of service to the song. Yeah, be, be, serve yeah. the song at all costs. Serve the song. And, and the bigger the band gets, the less you have to do. Yeah. So, you know, that band, you had. You know what, man? On. That's really. Yeah. I never heard it put that way, but that makes a lot of sense because most people that are focused on them are going to think, shit, this band's getting bigger. I really got to work hard, but it's the opposite. Well, look at the most natural, incredible guitar arrangers, Leonard Skinner. Okay. Three guitars that never get in the way ever always serving the song. Yeah. You know, you, you can get together me or you can get together with two other guys and just make a mess easily. Yeah. You know, uh, you know, Ed King, who God bless him, just passed away, sure. was, was brilliant at that, along with Alan and along with Gary. They were just about the song. Yeah. You know, you know it, it, what part they're playing was as important as playing the solo. And Al told me, because, you know, Al produced those first two records. So, you know, Cooper, uh, besides, then with, with me and Al and and, uh, and Super Session, and I'll get back to Leonard Skinner, because that's that's important, too, about learning about being a producer uh, and not a reducer, you know, <laughs> to just, it's already there. Just get it on tape, you know, be a producer. Uh, not You don't a have reducer. to put your, you don't have to put your, your stamp on it. You know, you don't have to say, Hey, I got to get in here and put my mark on this. If it's good, just record it. Great. You know, and get it mixed and out there. Cause Skinner was prepared. But anyway, let me go back to Alan super session. I had a old in the basement uh, my parents' house, uh, you know, where where I made music. Just in Jersey. Enough, in Jersey. 
we had one of those old hi fi's, you know, and it had like in the middle of you open up a thing and there's a record player and then there's a, a oh, the radio. Big, the cabinets with the, the, the speakers. Yeah, big yeah. long thing yeah. and two speakers on the side and a TV in the middle. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And and it was a console. And 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 on the left side was a big a radio. AM, FM, maybe just AM with big knobs, you know? And and then a record player in the middle. And then there was like a slot for your records. You could fit like you could fit the five records that most people had at the time. But, yeah. You know, they had they had Vaughn Meter's first family who was doing a doing the Kennedys, you know, and they had My Son the Nut by Alan Sherman. They had Alan Harry Belafonte, a Broadway show, you know, and and uh and, and like one one other record, be it uh you know, whatever whatever Bob Newhart's the button down. Frank bar, Sinatra or something. Frank Sinatra well those were yeah. Those were in a sacred place in another room. Yeah. The Frank records. <laughs> With the Frank and Dean and we're we're in that other room. Uh but down in the basement, uh, that record player only one side worked. <laughs> one speaker. <laughs> one side. Only one speaker worked, you know. And you had to go in around back and switch the terminals, you know, if it wasn't. And you could get the other one to work, okay. but never both of them to work. Uh. And I had Super Session. So I put it on, and it was great in that they, Al, when he mixed that record, he put Hard the, the guitar and the, the 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 guitar and the organ hard left and right. So when the organ in the organ side you'd hear like just this the reverb of a guitar, and on the guitar side you hear just a reverb of the organ. And down the middle was bass and drums. You'd always hear bass and drums. You'd always hear it. Um, and I remember putting it on, and and I was oh I had the organ going, you know, and I could just you know dig what Al was doing. I had my red Farfisa down there, and I was figuring out what Al was doing. And then one day when it had been switched around. I, I just heard the Bloomfield side and I got mesmerized by yeah. what Mike was playing. Um, Albert shuffle. is just like the mantra of all time. And it, it just hits me as, uh, and you know, Mike was, wasn't satisfied with it. He, he left in an insomniac, his, one of his typical insomniac moments and, and left Al a note. I got to go back, you know, to San Francisco yeah. we're cutting in LA. He says, I got to leave. I'm tired. I haven't slept. I'm done. Thanks. He did half a record. Now was stuck. He called everybody he could find. Finally, he found um, Stills. Stephen Stills, right? Yeah. Yeah. Who played a Black Les Paul. You doesn't even, it sounds like a Gretsch, you know? Whatever he plays, that's the old, that's another thing. He's a it's really good, hand. yeah, he's a really good he's player. He's a great player, uh, man. He's really and he had like, he had Marshall ship, the Marshall ship, the brand new Marshall there, and a brand new Gibson 68 Les Paul came with a big fee on it, you know. How cool Christina. is that? That's it. He's like, Y'all, I can get there, but I don't have any gear. So have these, they call this guy and they'll, you know, whoever they were talking to down, you know, in LA at the time, send some gear over. Brand new out of the box played. So, so that's where I. Still solo stuff, man. And, is just yeah, great. Amazing. Amazing. And then I found out that Al was also a guitar player, you know, quite a good guitar player. And years later, started working with him. <laughs> it, he had a band. My friends were in his band. I was working with Phoebe Snow at the time, and the band was was sharing Al Cooper. So when Al came in, he played guitar and piano, as I did with Phoebe. Mm. Guitar and B3, you know. And and uh, so he had no use for me. Until one day, when the keyboard player couldn't make Al's gig, the guys who I worked with, Phoebe said, oh, call Jimmy. He can play the or He can play the keyboard parts for your gig, you know, and, and he'll play piano when you're playing organ and organ when you're playing piano I said, great. So we did that. We had a great time. And, and I, we got along really great. It's one of those people you meet. Again, yeah. You know, um, I didn't talk about, Oh, a gaga about that's the other thing you don't, if you meet Robert plant, talk about muddy waters or Howlin' wolf. Don't y- talk about, Let's yeah, don't talk about the how- same yeah, thing yeah. goes with page. The, the, deflect the conversation. Or you'll be talking to them and you can literally see a brick wall go up as you're talking. Mm-hmm. If you start being a fan, just yeah. be a cat, be a person, you know, talk, let's talk about the people that we all still are in awe of, you know? And so with Al, you know, we just, you know, we just, we got along great. We talked about Ray Charles, whatever we, it was, it was that it was, and arrangers. We talked about, you know, he knew that I was an arranger too. And we talked about Hank Crawford who did all these great little small band things. And we talked about Maynard Ferguson and, you know, the original Blood, Sweat, and Tears arrangements. Oh, yeah. John Simon producing it, you know. 
And then another gig comes along and, and, and Larry, the Larry DeBarry was a dear friend of mine. He passed away. He was the guitar player. He couldn't make the gig. So I took, I show up with a guitar and Al gives me the, the Tom Wilson line. What are you doing here? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, and I'm like, well, I'm here to play guitar. And the guy said, yeah, he's, he's a guitar player. I can't believe it. So then we started working. Then Al called me and said, look, I want to, you know, I, I'm not going to use that band anymore, but I want you to put a new band together for me. I want you to play guitar, you know? And, bef- you know, and at that time, uh, we started getting really tight. And then we're pl- one night we we're playing a gig at the bottom line. And this is where the tone, this is where the guitar thing comes in. I had built this little makeshift pedal board at the time. And I had, uh, I had, a um, a goal, a 69 gold top that I got from Albert Molinaro at guitars R us when I was on, you know, on tour with Phoebe mm-hmm. and went down there and on Gower and I mean, sunset and Gardner, uh, where all the guitar stores were. There was a time, when it was the mecca of used guitars in Hollywood. So I had heard about Albert from Al Cooper. He said, yeah, my friend Albert, you should go there and check out the guitars at Guitars R Us. And it looked just like the Toys R Us sign. That's so funny. Guitar, you know, and now he's online. You can go online and, 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 and get stuff from Albert. Oh, the if same. I ever need a part, if That's... I ever need a, like, a, look, I need a 59 Les Paul ring. He says, it's going to cost you an arm and a leg and a tooth, you know? And I say, well, okay, you know, uh, <laughs> What else you got? You got a 68? (laughs) 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 Um, So I bought a Les Paul. And I had, so I had just a deluxe, a black face deluxe, up like on a little uh, Apple box, which we used to do at the bottom line, and my crappy pedal board, you know, and my, and my guitar. And, you know, and Al's like saying your sound, I don't know what, you know, you should listen to Michael Moore, you know, whatever, you know, not Michael Moore, by the way. Michael yeah, Michael, Moore. comma Moore. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> although I would listen to Michael Moore, he might have something to say. <laughs> maybe, I'm sure. maybe not about guitars, <laughs> but I'm you had sure definitely have everything. something. Yeah, about everything. yeah. <laughs> Good well, point. you know, in Detroit, we had Jim McCarty, you know, and he and, and we had, uh, you know, so so then one night we're playing the bottom line, and Joe Walsh is at the bar, right? There was a bar right to the right of the band, and Al says Joe's going to sit in. I said, okay, great, man. He said, you play your guitar. I said, sure. Of course. So Joe comes up and this is the lesson. Joe pulls it and just kicks the crappy pedal board aside and pulls the guitar out of it, plugs it straight into the deluxe and pins everything on 10, except the reverb of vibrato, of course. Those he turns off. He just everything, everything up all the way. And the sound of God came out of the guitar, you know, and I'm like, oh, God, okay, so I've been doing it wrong. There's a thing called a volume knob on a guitar <laughs> um, that when you have the amp pinned, and this is BB King too, uh, and this was Eric Clapton in the Beano days, you know, that when you just turn the volume down a little, it cleans up, it cleans it up nice. Yeah, it's amazing. And then you have this headroom. This was Leslie West on a on a on a junior. He knew how to operate a junior to get twelve tones out of it. Maybe you know? the best tone I yeah. mean, ever and another one by the way another guy that came out of the record collection that's one of my favorite people on earth you know yeah. he's i feel like he's my cousin you know a guy that i i hung out with you know when i was a kid you know and and taught me again about how to run a <laughs> one pickup junior that tone control and that that volume control the sweet spots in it so joe walsh blew me away i'm like and i love always love joe walsh but then i learned about what I say now to cats is, man, practice some unsafe guitar, you know, go directly in. Just take that wire and stick it right in the amp because that is the sound we're all trying to get with our pedal boards. It doesn't make sense. Somebody buys a Dumble, right? And they buy buy, buy an $800,000 uh, 59 Burst and they buy a, a Dumble for, I don't know, hundred grand more plus, whatever mm-hmm. they cost now. And then they have 14 pedals going into it. <laughs> Are we hearing the sound of a, of an eight hundred thousand dollar burst going into a two hundred thousand dollar amp? No, we're, no, we're not hearing a million dollars now. We're hearing you could take a brand new Les Paul and a JC one twenty, you know, <laughs> rolling jazz chorus, and put the and you'd hear those pedals just like you're hearing them, you know. So if you're gonna go amp crazy, just Plug it straight in, man. I got this guy, uh, um, 
Paul Sanders, who's got a company called Nolatone. And he, I don't know, he builds, I don't know how many amps, 10, 15 a year, maybe, you know, he's one of those guys that's a genius in his basement. And he's been, and a, and a guitar player friend of mine, Nick Morrock, who's this great guitar player, uh, Session Cat up in New York, turned me on to him. He said, you got to check this guy out. You just plug your guitar into these amps, man, and get. get what, the what's the name stuff. of the amps? Oh, Nolatone, N-O-L-A-T-O-N-E. Besides that, I use Magnetone, Park. Vox, Fender, everything. But lately, you know, Paul had gotten to contact me and said, look, I'll send you an amp. And then he sends me an amp and it's a prototype for me. He made it for me. We talked on the phone for a couple of hours and he sent me something for me, you know. And uh, and then he sent me another one that's different. <laughs> um, and he's really just one of these guys that... Uh, I, I don't want to throw the word genius around, but he's certainly, uh, you know, a professor. He's like a scientist about this stuff. Professor about of tone? tone? Straight up tone. About tone. He's a tone wizard. He's never satisfied. Uh, I, I have very little needs except for a tone control. Not a bass and treble so much, but just a tone control and a volume control, <laughs> you know, and, uh, and about 50 watts going into 112. And pinning it, and then turning. So, is that what you always do? All your amps are pinned. Everything. Well, I try to. I try to do that if I'm playing live. Uh, I I will say that I use effects on the show because in in a contained studio situation, I can't do that. You know, I can't pin it. So, so I have a lot of different effects companies that I work with on stuff. You know, Uh, mostly though, I I go with the Stevie Ray thing of of uh, with a distortion unit. Of not using it, more and more breaking up the front end of the amp. So the Stevie Ray thing with the with the the, the Ivan is uh, uh, the I eight hundred eight whatever it's called eight hundred what's it called a TS yeah eight hundred eight. Wait what? a minute, well, let me go back. So you're so if you have bass, treble, and mid as a control, are they all dimed as well? Uh no, you got to learn from the, the the room and the amp. You know, Bloomfield. Okay. Uh, I found out. I found out later from maybe Harvey Brooks and some other people. Bloomfield and Johnny Winter did this. They they pinned the volume, they pinned the treble, they put the mid range if you had it about halfway up, and the bass was like on two or off, <laughs> you know, on a twin. Okay, so Johnny Winter, you pinned it also, you know, and it depends. You can't pin the bass on a on a Fender combo. Mm. You get this farting out kind of sound. Yeah, yeah. And and it depends on the amp and the room and everything. But I think the volume has to be up almost all the way to get the amp cooking. You know, B.B. King did that. I saw B.B. do that, too. You know, and and he always left the amp wide open. Bonamassa does that. Bang. Joe is like, we're playing a small club in L.A. Hmm. Joe comes in. He'll turn the amp against the wall if he has to so he can pin so, it. So he can dime it. Okay, so interesting. Can, yeah. you, you got to dime that volume control. And then he'll, we'll mess around with it, you know, depending on which guitar you're playing. You don't want to do that with an Esquire pin the treble, you know. But Johnny Winter would with a Firebird. Imagine. Yeah. And I know because I sat in the front row of the film, row five maybe, not the front row of, at the Fillmore, when Johnny came out one time with three of those JBL loaded twins stacked on each on top of each other, all dimed out with a Firebird. I had to duck under the seats every time he took yeah. the solo, mm-hmm. you know. But it was a great tone, you know. And and all the guys I saw. Coming up, you know, Terry Kath was one of the greatest in oh, Chicago. God, yeah. Straight into the amp. There was no, you know, a Wawa was it. Not many guys were using fuzz boxes that much uh, by the time my, you know, by the time the psychedelic thing kind of ended, you know, uh, it was more about getting a, a really good guitar tone from a Marshall. M- Robin Trower uh, was one of the greatest sounds I ever heard with, and- with Crocodile and Aram. A gold top. You know, a gold top and a red 50-watt, you know, half stack. Well, even uh, now, I've seen him like three or – I think two or three times in the last 10 years. And, it, it, God, it's yeah, he, sound amazing. He I mean, uses he's a, a Univibe and a Wawa, and that's, that's it. it. See, what that's a it. sound, and, though. I mean, it's like yeah. – Yeah. it's Yeah, another one that that killed me, you know, uh, that that I was like, God, this guy is good, you know. And I watched him through Proko Haram and, and, and followed him all the way through even even – even the, he did a 
something with Jack Bruce and Bill Lord and even yeah. you know, BLT. Uh, you know? Yeah, that was great, man. Yeah, that, yeah. when, when just, Jack Bruce was, was a yeah. wizard. I had uh, interviewed him once. It was a great. There used to be a, a magazine called Twentieth Century Guitar out in Long Island, and I had interviewed him. Interviewed Robin. Yeah, yeah. We had this kind of an, a, a line hooked up where we. We we taped him. I called him. He was in England, and I called him, and we talked about stuff, and uh, and I talked about the Procol Harum thing, you know, and and how it was magical, the way that was a piano and organ band, you know, and then it seemed like somebody would open the closet door, and this guitar solo would come out, and then they'd close the door again, and <laughs> like you wouldn't hear him. And he said, "Yeah, you know, I was and and talk about like." what were some of the lower points or the more challenging times of your career? And how did you like manage to get through them? I it was, you know, there was a point where I was just working to work and I was playing, I was playing a piano, you know, keyboards at the time. And it would be in the seventies, you know, and it was, it was keyboards in lounges in New Jersey, you know, and just getting depressed. Totally, because things were starting to happen for some friends of mine who were going into the city, you know, and and not just staying in New Jersey and working for the sake of work, because you get that thing where, well, I'm going to work six nights a week and I'm going to make three hundred dollars a week, you know, mm-hmm. play five sets a night. And it's it's 19 whatever, 76, 77. And it's like things are starting to happen in New York. You know, the punk scene is starting to explode down there and, and live music of, of, of people writing their own music. And just like it's it's starting to really thrive again in New York. And it's not just about working. And that's when I, you know, switched a little after that. Let's see. So to guitar. 78. Yeah. When when 78, 77, 78 comes around, I'm just going to play guitar. So so I. I got a, I got a, I got myself a three thirty five from a friend of mine who was moving to Australia and sold it to me. I got a three thirty five and I had a Fender amp, just a little deluxe. And uh, I, I got the guitar and I started taking lessons. I had seen this guy Jack Wilkins. Oh playing. God, yeah, yeah. He was playing in Buddy Rich's small band, is is uh, at Buddy's place in New York and. I would go and watch Jack, Anthony Jackson was on bass and, and Jack Wilkins was playing guitar. And, uh, and this is, I think before he started playing with Manhattan transfer, he was just like a, a great guitar player. Yeah. So I'd studied with a cat named Joe Cinderella already for about a, a two years who had taken me to a point where he said, you need to go to somebody else now. And I went to a guy named Harry Leahy, who was another jazz guy. Dude, that's Jimmy Leahy's dad. Yeah. Yeah, really? yeah, I got Jimmy coming on the show like next week, I think. So I went to Harry Leahy, and it was, and I probably, and I don't know how old Jimmy is. He might have been one of those kids running around the house. Jimmy's but, like, or my age, I'm 54. He's really close, maybe yeah, a little so younger, he was a little older. Like Ten years younger than me. He was like 20. You know, I was, I was 20. He was like 13 or 12. You know, that's wild. He was 11 or 12 years old then, and I remember going to Harry Leahy's house and. It was this huge house in Jersey. And, you know, and there was like a big Irish family there, you know, and, and Harry wore like those sweaters in the house, you know, it was, like the it was cable. Yeah. 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 Big, yeah. And, and, you know, I, I remember, and I have this another romantic vision, of course, of there being like a wood burning stove or something in the room where we, you know, it was probably impossible to heat this house for a jazz <laughs> musician, you know, but Harry was the guy to go to when you reach that next level. So, you know, I had been through Joe Cinderella and he said, you got to go to Harry Leahy now, which is you know? really cool of a teacher to tell you yeah. that honestly. Yeah. 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 He said, uh, you, you know, you, and, and he had, you know, Joe had taken guys like Dave Spinoza and John Trope and all those guys I knew. And, and, uh, and I wanted to study with Bucky Pizzarelli who went to, he went to high school with my father. So when I told oh, wow. my father, you know, I wanted to start. I seriously want to play guitar now. I don't want to do this. You know, I was still living at home, you know, back at home. I had lived away from home. And your parents, Italian parents, always let you move back in anytime. Anytime. You're welcome, you know. But how cool. So I was living, I, living in the attic. And I said, yeah, Dad, I got to, 
He says, well, let me give give Bucky a call. So he gives Bucky a call. He puts me on the phone with Bucky. And Bucky says, man, he was, I think Bucky was playing the Tonight Show at the time or doing some other stuff. And I says, Jimmy, I really don't, I don't have time, but go see Joe Cinderella. He's just up in Saddle, you know, Upper Saddle River. Just drive up there and, and go see him. And I went to Joe and it was great. One of the, He taught me more than anybody uh, you can imagine. I mean, he was a great teacher and a great player. And he ended up being a, being just a really good friend. And but hold, um, on, hold on one minute, man. I got, you got, I got to give you credit here because that, that's a pretty, that's a pretty impressive thing, man, that you just said, Hey, I'm going to put the, I'm going to put the brakes on, but I want to do this thing and I'm going to, I'm willing to start all over basically. Yeah. But my parents let me too, you know? No, but I'm talking about you know, to I have the determination. Yeah, and I, and I was living, and my father, you know, had always said to me ever since I was a kid, you can always come and work a carpentry job with me, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and I did for a while. While I was doing that, I started freelancing as a, a sheet rocker, you know, and spackle. Sheet rock, sure. I could sheet rock and spackle. So I started working not only for my father doing that, but I got some other side gigs doing that with another friend of mine who was a musician. So, you know, we could do that. We could do a spackle job and listen to music all day, you know, leave the radio on. Sure. And and here, and yeah, I remember like at one point, like doing a spackle job and like things like Long Cool Woman were coming on by the Hollies. The Hollies yeah. These great records were coming on and I, I listened to the radio all day long. So anyway, I'm, I'm studying with Joe. He says, it's time for you to, you should see Harry. He said, now that's the guy. So he turns me on to Harry and I go to Harry and it was it was great. Uh, there was more, you know. I couldn't yeah. believe there was more. And then I would go see these guys play, you know. And Harry would play at a place. Um, oh, it was a Gregory's. It was called. It was a guitar bar, you know. And I and I saw uh, I saw Jimmy, uh, um, uh, not Johnny Smith, but uh, um, J- Jimmy Smith. No, no, no. The guy who played uh, Tal Farlow. He okay. was painting signs in Seagirt, New Jersey. He was a sign painter. Right. But Tal Farlow, it turned out, I remember when I was a kid, one of the first bands I had when I was nine or ten, my friend Brian Hadley's mother was Dardanelle Hadley, Dardanelle, who was a, a singer, p- jazz piano player and singer. And she and she brought Tal Farlow up with her from the South, you know, in the in the fifties. And and I found that he was still living and playing gigs now and then. And I would go see him and Jimmy Bruno and uh, all these guys, Joe Cinderella, Joe Pass. They all played these guitar bars, Gulliver's, you know, and Harry Leahy played and and uh, and uh, a guy named Vic Senecola that nobody ever heard of that couldn't tie his own shoes but could play like, you know, yeah. <laughs> he was a savant. This incredible guitar player, Vic Juris came. Vic out Juris, there. yeah, a great player. Yeah, Vic Juris was like like a little a little older than me, and he was one of the guys. Great and, player. And Bob DeVoe. Bob DeVoe was another. Jersey was like an organ lounge, you know, mecca, and all these jazz guitar players, uh, uh, Jimmy DeAngelis, so many Thornell Schwartz that played with uh, Larry Young in Newark, you know, and you'd go to these places like Patterson in Newark and see, you know. Uh, just you know, just you know, Melvin Sparks, you know, all these cats, and uh, so you so just Harry, totally uh, immersed yourself in education, in guitar. yeah. In, but in jazz guitar too, because um, I just wanted the background to connect it, you know, to connect it to um, all kinds of, you know, being able to read and being able to know all my chords, you know. And I knew that I wasn't when I, when I went to see Jack then. And I went to Buddy's place, and I can't. It must have been just after the Harry thing, and I saw saw Jack Wilkins play. I said, "I gotta meet this guy." So I went up and talked to him, uh, and he said, "Yeah, he gave me his number." He said, "Come on over." He said, "Bring a bottle of wine," <laughs> and he would, and and he and he started writing out. I think Harry got me into the three notes on a string scale thing, you know, skipping strings and. You know, and, and 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 into modes and stuff. And then Jack was trying to get me into the not only the chops thing, but the solo, the chord melody thing. And he was so good, I would just say, "Just uh, look, just play for me." And I would watch him play. And then after I don't know about ten lessons with with Jack Wilkins, I said, 
I am never doing this. I'm way too late to the party for this, and I can't dedicate myself to it because I wanted to play all you, kinds you, of music. I want, but I got so much out of it. So then, what I did was I said, "This is what I'm going to do." I got some guitar knowledge now. I'm going to immerse. I'm going to lose myself in a show band and go to like Florida and Vegas and in this show band. There was this Martin and Lewis kind of act called Andre and Sorrell in Jersey, and we played all those Jersey mafia show joints. You know. And one was a comedian like Jerry Lewis, and one was a singer like Dan, Mar uh, mm -hmm. like uh, Dean Martin, and that was the model for for the show band in the, in the '70s. So I got in that band, and I just worked and worked and worked and played and played and played, and just every day when we weren't, if we were on the road, I would just practice all day in my hotel. Was that deliberate that you said I'm going to be in a show band, or that opportunity came up and you just took it? Uh, no, I just I said, you know what. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna get lost somewhere, you know. Yeah. So, so uh, get lost and learn and and kind of take that journey, you know, that takes you out of town. Yeah. And then you come back. Hopefully, you you got more together. Yeah, you yeah. Know, you're together as a player. Uh, and I learned a lot about then entertaining and stuff from those guys. So I went and did that, you know. And I went and did that. And um, when I I came back and I was playing guitar pretty good I, I started playing guitar then around just around you know in in, in bands and um uh, and at the same time my brother floyd who little a lot of people don't know he had a tv show that was a cult thing the uncle floyd show okay you know, so my brother jerry's a sax player my brother myself and we were three kids that grew up as a dance team you know d doing ted mack kind of competitions dancing at the world's fair we were playing we were dancing at the jersey we had our, our little tap dancing team dancing at the new jersey pavilion in 64 to world's fair and al cooper an hour later would play at the under the carousel at the queen's pavilion with harvey brooks and you know so it was 64 so i was nine when i started actually being in show business that's wild so, now floyd so is not an italian name uh, Florio is. Uh, oh, okay, there you go. I was like, no, there's no Italian family named their kid Floyd. <laughs> yeah, my grandfather was Florio. Was Florio yeah. My grandfather was Florio, and, you know, nobody could call a man Florio in, in 1900. You know? Sure, and, sure. Well, he was born in 1900, came over here in, like, the 20s, and uh, in, like, 25 or something, and, and he was Floyd. You know, you get to, El, you get to Ellis El Island. Yeah. Florio, Floyd. Yeah. You know, <laughs> we don't know if the Vivianos are related to the Vivinos because of a misspell. Here. Yeah, sure, man. So, so anyway, we uh, Floyd had this great show, and it was like, kind of like the Soupy Sales show. Uh, it was, it was, it was a, a kiddie show for adults. Sure. For stoned out adults, he had a following of John Lennon, David Bowie, uh, Joey Ramone. The Ramones came on all the time. David Joe. That's where I met Johansson back then. And I started doing live shows with my brother. We put a little uh, uh, quartet up together to back up to do live Uncle Floyd shows. And we played the bottom line in New York. And Very that's cool. where Alan Pepper, who ran the bottom line, kind of discovered me as a band leader and, and started throwing work my way. <sighs> I got Ronnie Spector coming in. I got put a band together. I got, you know, and that's. and So you became the house band. Me with, well, he had seen me with Floyd by now. He had seen me with Phoebe Snow by now. And he had seen me uh, with Al Cooper, you know, and by now I was doing the double keyboards or so now the keyboard playing play paid off all that depression I was having about, you know, not being good enough because I knew guys that were, you know, and that, we all go through that. Yeah. And the, the reason I got so depressed about the keyboard, because I had so many friends that were organ players and piano players that were, I thought, so much better than me, though they might not bring enough that might bring too much to the party sometimes so i learned then from al too about just play the right part man you know unless you're out there playing a jazz gig and you're you know then that's different but when you're in a band play the right part so then alan pepper started throwing other stuff my way and, and before you know it i was you know working with him and paul schaefer on that show and then i got the laura nero gig through that um See, Laura came to the show, or, and, and Laura came to the Lone Star to see me playing with Benny King or something, and uh, and then called me, and I worked with Laura Nero and Felix, John Sebastian, all these blues cats that I had chased down as a kid. I finally started doing, you know, I would I worked at a 
I was putting bands together for a, a place called Chicago Blues. Uh, in they would call me and say, Otis Rush is coming to town. Wow. Needs a band. And I would say, okay, you know, Sugar Blue, Otis Rush, you know, uh, whoever. I would say, yeah. And I would always get the guys and we go back to that. Man, respect the material. Don't think you're coming to play a blues gig. Mm. And it's just, oh, I can do that. It's three chords. Listen to that cat's records, man. You know, because if you play the music right, it's the show's going to be great. You know, the the musician who's doing a, uh, picking up a pickup band, if the band is ready and, and great and really knows the stuff, they're going to really perform great. But if the band is skating through it, it's going to be hell for that guy. And he's just want to get out of there, you know. And, uh, so so and, this was tremendous tuition for you to get to, you know, you were basically learning how to become a session player. Yeah. Playing yeah. yeah. I did some sessions where I did some sessions. You know, when I first, that's how I met Ellie Greenwich, uh, you know, who, who we did the leader of the pack show about my friend, Lee Shapiro that I went to high school with was, uh, was in the four seasons, you know, and, uh, and, and around the time when they had that resurgence, with Oh What a Night and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Can't Take My Eyes Off You and all that great, you know, that later stuff. My friend Lee, who we had bands with and, and I had bands with in high school. So he called me knowing that I was playing guitar now uh, to do a demo session with this songwriter, Ellie Greenwich, who I, you know, didn't know at the time. And and Patty Smythe was the artist. Wow. She had a band called Scandal later. Yeah. And she was the waitress. She was a waitress. So we had to do the, the session at midnight when she was off her shift. And she came in. I remember the song. I remember the song. It was really, really cool. We did like two songs. And uh, and Ellie Greenwich was producing and wrote this. And that's where I met her. So when Alan Pepper said I was gonna, he was going to do this show and he had this kid uh, that could be music director, Ellie said, oh, I know that guy. He, he worked on Patti Smythe stuff. Yeah, sure. Bring him in, you know. So it kind of doors opened again, and um, so now I was playing full fledged band leader playing guitar, and uh, and and the bottom line was my that was my campus man, and every I played with everybody there, man. There was some great great yeah. shows there, man. So you and you, then that moved into some other uh, you know TV shows that I worked on, and then you know uh, I, I did uh, Legendary Ladies of Rock because I was known for backing up all these. You know, let's see, Ronnie Spector, Darling Love, you know, all of all, uh, Shirley Austin from the 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 uh, Shirelles and uh, uh, oh my God, who else was on that? Uh, it was just great, legendary. It was just all these women, and it was just such great music. And then I did, uh, you know, th those kind of shows, those kind of live shows where where we would I'd put a band together and we'd play at the Garden. And that's when I first met Chuck Berry, the first time I met Chuck, before Johnny, you know. Oh, so you backed him up. You were his house band when he came to town. Well, he came to town. We did a thing at the Garden, and he was the headliner. But there was also Little Anthony and Imperials. There was like 10 other bands. So I did charts or, or you know, music directed that. The, my band backed up the whole thing. at the, And, and Chuck was the closer. And, and this is my first encounter. He's, <laughs> he says... Uh, I said, I, I, he didn't say anything. And I said, I want to meet Chuck Berry. I want to bring the band in and talk down on the show. He never did that. You know, he figured everybody knows my stuff. He said, so we go back there and he's, he's like really nice, you know, really dressed sharp and everything. He said, just watch my leg. That was his thing. Watch my leg. You know, and, and he, he said to me, oh, yeah, you're real old time. He's talking to me. I said, oh, wow, he's playing. What a compliment he's playing. So I find out later that means that wasn't a compliment. He wanted. He didn't, he didn't want to do that, those songs like those records. This was the one time I was heartbroken that he wanted to do anything because I was talking about how yeah, it's great the way the drums are swinging against the straight eights. You know, find out later and the and Willie Dixon's walking up there. Those then what made those records so great? He hated that about those records. He was the, he was so wrong in that you know because we all know even Keith Richard went through hell later. In Hail, Hail, Rock and Roll, trying yeah. to get Chuck to understand that those were great records. And that, you know, Joey Spampanato was playing bass from NRBQ. And and he was trying to play like the Willie Dixon thing. And Joey said, yeah, Chuck tried to tell me just it's three notes. Boom, boom, boom. He said, no, it's it moves. Listen to it. You know, he said, I don't like it. I never liked it. 
He's like one of those confrontational cats. Yeah, he's just yeah angry. But when I played with him with Johnny Johnson and we played the shit right, he loved it. Okay, so so you know he would want to kick me off the stage all the time and I'd have one guitar. Yeah, He'd duck walk over and say, "You're playing my parts." Well, I said, "I hope so." <laughs> you know the rhythm. You're yeah. playing the lead, you know. And I found out later from Hubert Sumlin and Jimmy Rogers, who, who I worked with both of those guys, that they played second guitar and a lot of that stuff. Oh, Hubert wow. said, I got $40 to come in and play like two sides with Chuck Berry. He's on school days and Sweet Little 16. I said, wow. Yeah. You know, I'm playing, yeah, yeah. So he said, there was a rhythm guitar. It was me, you know, or Jimmy Rogers did, whoever, you know, I'm sure Buddy Guy might have even, who knows? You know, sure. Come in and. You know, the Chess Brothers had a thing, man. They, they they paid guys to come in and do sessions for other guys. Mm. So Dixon's on all of those, you know, and Fred Bilo. It's a lot of Muddy Waters band is in there playing those Chuck and Bo Diddley records. And um, so so now it's kind of like I'm more known as a band leader and I'm doing that, you know, and um, getting to play with a lot of people that I want to play with. And I'm never concerned about my own career as far as being an artist. Though I'm writing songs and I'm and I'm performing and and doing that. Uh, what makes you happiest you know, musically? Doing what? Playing, just playing live now. Being out there on, on stage, playing. You know, I have my own band. You know, the Black Italians was a band that came together. Uh, it just got bigger and bigger. Started as a trio and then ended up being like eight or ten people. You know, whoever came to sit in was in the band. So, <laughs> and we played down on Thirtieth Street, right around the corner from the Garden. And everybody would come. Mick Fleetwood came down and, you know, everybody would, Fleetwood Mac was playing. They would, you know, come down and sit in with us and Clarence come down and play with me. Clarence Clemens, of course, you know, Nils Lofgren, Elliot Randall, uh, you know, whoever was around town. Oh, yeah, it's a happening thing on, on Tuesday nights or at a place called Downtime. And uh, and that's where I met a lot of other great, great musicians in New York when I had finally moved in, into town out of Jersey. Hmm. Um, and so, so, you know, now that we talked about before that, you know, the Conan show was going to a half hour talk format, you know, uh, with no live music, I'm still going to work writing music cues, you know, and, and doing what I always do with the writers as far as comedy bits and, but I'll be there alone now instead of with my guys. You know, we won't have wow. a band anymore and there won't be live music. We're not going to be a music show. But we're we're in the middle of the landscape drastically changing the delivery system, I say, of television. Uh, when we were kids and we heard the Stones were going to be on Ed Sullivan, we would sit there for two weeks by the TV and wait for <laughs> yeah. the night to come. You know, just can't wait. Another day till the Stones come on. Now, oh, I didn't see it, but I'll watch it on YouTube the next day or I'll stream it on their website. You know, I don't have to, you don't have to make an appointment with TV anymore. So it's um, music becomes, is becoming less important on TV because we can see it on YouTube anytime, did, anywhere. Did they come to that decision because they went back and checked everything on, on, on social media or whatever and said, Hey, I'm sure. these, I'm this sure. gets more attention. So this is then, then the band that came on. Well, you know, you know, uh, as far as look, I have great friends, uh, you know, Mark Marin and, you know, and, and Dean Del Rey that have, that have podcasts and that this wasn't, wasn't happening 10 years ago. Mm. Okay. Is this thing that that's happening now? You yeah. and I talk like this, and we're going to stream it. Yeah, because people will go in their cars and stream your podcast while they're driving all day long. They won't yeah. even listen to music now, right? If they want to listen to music, they can. It's so easy to get music now, where it used to be, go to the record store. You know, yeah, get there. Get not, that, yeah, open that, open that, take that, smell that vinyl, put it on, turn it over, dust read it, read the cover. It, yeah, you yeah. know, just worship it yes. for what it was. Listen to it again, you know, and every track on it, not just one track. Right. We didn't have the luxury. I just want to buy that one track. Yeah. You know, what we could with a single. Well, you didn't even want to. I, I never wanted to, and I wanted to have a relationship with that yeah, artist. And, 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 and and the and the song order was so important. Very much. You know, when you made a record in those days, putting that that running order together was so important mm. in order to keep the, the listener, you know, in in the game with you. And all that's changed. That's all gone. 
there's so much gone uh, that was so important to me um, and a lot of other people. And also make an appointment with your TV. Look, I got to watch MASH tonight because I'm not going to see it maybe till the summer right. when they rerun it. And I could miss that. Sure. You would see something once. You had one chance to watch it yeah. and you were there and the advertising dollars were huge because they had the, they had the viewer. Correct. They had the viewership. The numbers were huge. And now, and there were four stations, you know, yeah. four, TV, four networks and UHF, and it changed now to where we, and Bruce had the song, you know, how many stations, I don't know, 100 stations and nothing to watch, yeah. something something in, in that, you know, something in that, it's a funny thing because we do do it still, and we'll say, ah, oh, there's nothing to watch, but now there's reality TV has not only taken over uh, jobs from writers and actors, Right. Actual mm. people who would yeah. write TV shows. The irony of stupid people throwing them up on the screen is is more entertaining to people than a show like MASH or All the Family was to us. And we, I sound like a bitter old guy when I say that, but we were living in this Kardashian reality, uh, reality world that lets us elect our leaders. Uh, based on their popularity from their TV appearances. Yeah. Okay. So it's finally bit us in the ass. What sold John Kennedy has torpedoed the entire system now. All right. So I'm with you on this reality stuff. I I don't, I've never watched one. I can't, it's just, yeah, there's nothing, there's nothing real about it when it comes down to it. No, but that that's the pity. That's the, that's the pitiful lives that people are leaving. Yeah. That young girls feel like because they watch that show, they got to go get their lips pumped up and they're and, they're, and all 16. kinds of cosmetic work, work at 16 years mm-hmm. old, you know, and and make the selfie face and just, you know, and it's like it's almost like but it's it's damaging to to uh, uh, to have that as a self image, um, you know, and maybe that's going to change sometime. You know, I, there's an awareness now that maybe we may be a little too aware of uh of, of the problems we have uh, because we put people in a position to, to uh, dictate policy to us. That's just out and out, out and out crazy, you know? So uh, we should spend more time in the reality of reality. Like, you know, trying to figure out what people are, oh. are, are actually saying when they're being elected rather than, Oh, I like that guy. Cause I saw him on TV. You know, I know that it doesn't mean anything um, in the long run. I want to get out and play live music, you know, play and play my music and, and do things now because in a way it's after 25 years, the golden handcuffs have come off. Yeah, so yeah. I get to go back out, you know, and, and graciously like every great old blues musician I know die on stage, you know, oh, and, well, uh, hopefully and, not. and it's almost like the pasture is greener now for that, for me. Uh, I, I really like, to, I meet a lot of people when I and going out to play now. It's going to be what I'm going to do, you know. And and besides that, putting on a lot of live shows. I told you before, I'm working with Greg Williamson in New York and Upper West Side Productions, and we're putting on a couple of, of, of great shows. But last year we did a before BB King's closed, we did a big benefit for the Blues Foundation, and, and it was great. Um, we had all all kinds of response and great players come out. And this year we're doing one in. October nineteenth at the Ace Hotel, and that's three. Uh, that's that's three days from the day this airs. So everybody, pay attention here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, John Prine, Bob Weir, Leon Womack, uh, uh, Lucinda Williams. I'm trying to list everybody. Uh, Joe Lewis gonna, Walker. Joe you Lewis said. Walker, Shamika Copeland, uh, Larkin Poe. Who, if you have not heard Larkin Poe, these two sisters from Georgia, they're incredible. One plays uh, a Stratocaster on a bass drum. And the other plays a lap steel and they sing and they're, they're beautiful and they're great, great, great musicians. And they open for Seeger, I think. Yeah. I, I met them, you know, Elvis, I, I called Elvis. I was going to go see him play, uh, in, in, in Santa Barbara, I think. They said, yeah, you got to come early. Cause you know, you, uh, he was doing his solo tour and he wanted me to sit in with him. So we were going to rehearse some things, but you got to see these two girls that I have opened up these sisters. And I'm like, okay. So I go to sound check, and uh, me and Elvis run over some things we're going to do together uh, out there. 
And then we leave the stage and they're going to take, because they're opening, they're going on and sound checking. And I see these two, I mean, absolutely beautiful women, right? You get up there and, and, and I, the, the thing that runs through my head is how can they, you know, how can they possibly, but Elvis has them open. They must be great. But I'm, I'm doing the uh, total wrong thing in my head saying they're too beautiful to be, <laughs> to be fantastic right now that's this is me like admitting that i i I took a sexist stand there for a second yeah i heard him though i just i didn't care like all that other shit that went through my head was totally meaningless they were so good and uh and down to earth and i said well you know i i just never heard anything like those two girls together sisters something about sisters it's like the everly brothers yeah the sisters you know the sisters and brothers singing together, and uh, and and they're so strong um, in this world. You know to be out there doing that and uh, and opening for Elvis Costello and killing it, and then coming up and finishing the show with him. That's and so I, cool. Boy, this is the greatest introduction I've had to a couple of musicians that I didn't know or wouldn't know of. Um, so there's still people finding these gems and bringing them out and saying, I got to put these kids on in front of me, you know, and that's, that's what Elvis is so great about that, you know, and, and it was, it's, it was amazing to me that they certainly did sound even better than they look. <laughs> it was okay. Yeah. You know, we come from a society of, Oh, you know, it, it, what does it look like? You know, man, it's it, it. another reality TV problem. And I'm, you know, and we're all guilty of it sometimes. And I admittedly, uh, and embarrassed for thinking that they couldn't be great, <laughs> you know, uh, just, just, um, you learn, you learn, you learn, you learn all the way to the end. You know, you learn something right to the last breath. So Jimmy, I want to ask you, I want to ask you, the show. they're on. And Donald uh, uh, Bramble the third is on the show. In, the second, rather. In second. The third in, hasn't come yet. Yeah. I think and, he's got and a girl. guy named Tash Neal who has a band called the London souls, right. They made a couple of records that you got to check out the London souls were just one of my Al Cooper turned me on to these kids. Right. I mean, I met Tash and he's like that cross of he's that Jimi Hendrix and Prince and Sly cross, you know, along with this like English, you know, let's call it blues rock sensibility about his playing. You know, that's one of, one of my favorite people too. He's on it. Oh man, we just we're just having a ball, and there's some other friends coming that I can't announce yet, even because they have other big shows coming up in the L.A. area, but they are showing up to play. But and, uh, and this is at the Ace Hole Ace Hotel in L.A. on the 19th. Yeah, on, on on October 19th, and that's one that's one that Greg Williamson, who has become a great friend of mine, he was like a fan that used to come up to the Rambles, uh, you know, and decided to get into promoting. So we do things in New Orleans. We do things in uh, New York. We do things in L.A. We're looking to expand into some other areas and and do these kind of review shows, you know, always with a cause. He also does God's Love We Deliver with John Varvatos every, every – I think it's in March in New York City at the Beacon, and they do these big shows. That Will Lee is the – my buddy Will Lee, who I work in Fab Fall with, which, you know, we can or don't do or do not have to get into. That's just our – you know, Will and I lived in the same building when he was doing Letterman and I was doing Conan. And he would every night in the elevator say, uh, just as I, you know, I'd be getting off and he was two floors above me. Hey, let's start a Beatle band. And I said, oh, cool. see ya. You know, why? And all. And he kept saying it. And I'm like, is he serious? One day he called me. He says, come on up. Come upstairs. So Will finally says, come upstairs. I got three other guys up here, you know. So there we were. And he says, uh seriously want to want to do this i want to play the beatles music like it's our classical music you know i want people to i want to bring the records to the stage and not the stage to the records people are going out there dressed up and doing accents and you know doing those funny beetle Liverpool yeah, yeah. accents that are crappy americans with wigs and noses and suits you know what they think are the right instruments but they can't play and you know, and they, yeah, yeah, they're mimicking them vocally even. And it's almost like 
I said, yeah, it's kind of like the Hall of the Presidents, you know, at Disneyland. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where they're just an animatronic version. So I said, or it's, it's like my grandmother used to keep wax fruit in a bowl. <laughs> God, and the I minute you took a, a of bite that. out of it, you knew it wasn't real. Oh, my so God. So I call those guys saying we either call them wigs and suits or rat, wax fruit bands. Some of them are really fantastic, though, if that's what you're into, if you want to, want that kind of a show. But we're like totally about, look, we're all musicologists. We're professional musicians. Let's yeah. dissect these records. Let's get the sounds. Let's get into the production of them. And uh, so we've been doing that 20 years. So it's been pretty successful uh, on a music level. You know, Do you have any so, tours? Any any tours scheduled? Well, we're, we're uh, no no tours. We we just we're playing at the end of the month. We're going to do the White Album in L.A. on the 29th of September. You're going to do the whole White Album. Yeah, that's yeah. so cool, man. Yeah, yeah, including um, <laughs> including uh, Revolution Nine, which is scripted. Wow, and, uh, and we've made tape loops, our own tape loops, uh, similar. You know, our our version of those tape loops. Uh, and and it goes by like a timeline. We, we feel kind of a pulse, and uh, there's there's a script with a timeline under it. You wait three seconds to say this or that, and you know Will went through the painstaking, uh, you know, <laughs> just just the dissection of that piece alone. I think John Lennon would have loved it that somebody was doing it live because it's theater. It's so uh, cool, man. And it's great. And we also then will play Good Night right after it, which is the last track on the record mm-hmm. that most people don't know because they took the needle off the record <laughs> and a- didn't F- listen yeah. to Revolution 9. It was a great song, by the way, that came after it. Uh, beautiful that Ringo does. I bet it's not really that well known. So, so yeah, so that's another project that just goes on. That's, you know, that's almost, we, we put that together as Boys Night Out Bowling, you know? Yeah, so yeah. Let's do something we want to do. And it, and it stuck. And uh, it never gets old. It's one of my favorite things to do. And I got to say, Will Lee is just one of the best musicians in the world. Uh, probably the best one I know, you know, as a bass player and just bass player's not enough. He's just a great musician, you know, and he comes from a family. His father was, uh, you know, the head of the down in Florida, University of Miami, the uh, music program. Oh, I didn't know that. Program. Holy yeah, shit. That's cranked a ton of great guys out of that program. Oh, yeah. Yeah, well, that's where he met Hiram Bullock, and they oh, came. Oh, <laughs> that makes sense now. Wow. Yeah. Hey, man, I I know we got a time. Hey, how thing. did you how how did you guys fare with the storm? It didn't come down that far. Or? Nowhere oh. near us. It's up in the Carolinas. Thank you very oh, okay. much for us. Thank God. And yeah, I was. So, I mean, I is, feel there, so is there anything we didn't cover? I want to. I want to ask you. I want. There's a shit ton of stuff, but I want to ask you one more question because we we you got a boogie. Um, oh, I've got, we got 15 minutes. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> What's been the biggest change in your personality over the last 10 years? And has this change been intentional or has it just been a natural part of aging? I think it's, I I think, and that's easy to answer. I think on on a music level, especially, I think it's been accepting. And we talked about this earlier before we were actually doing the the podcast. Uh, I I felt, I, I feel now that I'm, wide open to all things that become popular because there's a reason to not judge music is not out there to be judged you know frank Mm. zappa said it's like writing about music is like dancing about architecture you know it's like (laughs) you know (laughs) and and no and and it's like it's pointless it's pointless and it's usually coming from critics are usually people who can't do it you know yeah don't do it and and who am I if something if something is selling millions of records and I won't, don't even have to mention any names. Sure. All you have to do is look at a chart and 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 say, OK, well, people are liking this, you know, so this is important. There's something in there that people are liking. You know, I used to I used to be very I was judgmental about hip hop for a long time, you know, saying it's not music, but it is it is in the same way that we deconstruct records I did growing up and finding out what's in them. That's what somebody who puts these beats together does. Yeah, They're making music and, and, and it's a totally different place. It's all like, it's all uh, uh, taking stuff from a, a shopping list and putting it into, you know, putting into the stew to make the stew. Yeah, I mean, for anyone to say there's no work involved in that is crazy, you know, and there's no, and poetry has always been a part of rock and roll. Chuck Berry is a hip hop poet as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> He's 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 hitting people 
He was hitting people about school and cars and girls and, and the man, you know, you know, his boss giving him a hard time. You know, it goes back to it even goes back further, you know, that that it's all that, that was the those were the concerns of teenagers in the 50s. They can't be the concerns now. You know, the concerns are different. Yeah. It's heavier. If you listen to some of this the rap and hip hop shit, you know that there's there's some real concerns going on, you know, yeah, yeah. and and there's and, and a lot of it needs to be addressed, um, you know, politically and socially. And um, and it's and it's it's valid. And to think that it's not, you know, you, you don't want to you don't want to wither on the vine while shit's happening. You know? Yeah, yeah. So I've seen a lot of it come together, too, where the thing that I always hoped for was happening. It's been happening for many years of, you know, that where you have hip hop and, and and heavy metal or rock and roll yeah. kind of coming together. Sure. Because it's the same, you know, rock and roll is a complaint. It always has been. And that's. And that's what it has to remain, you know, for it to be really valid. And that's why punk kicked the ass of everything sweet and mellow that was going on and chop wise. And, you know, and, and it was an, it was a, re- a gut reaction to stuff like the yes, you know, and King Crimson and all that prog stuff that I love. Personally, yeah. yeah. You know, and all the rush and everything that's like chops. And it was like, I can't do this. Fuck it. I'm just going to play these three chords really loud and scream over it. Yeah. And in, in, in rebellion. And that's necessary. The complaint part is really necessary. Rock and roll won't go away as as long as people have issues. You know, a society without rock and roll, that's that's our political platform more than anything. And we have to if we could get as many people that listen to other people complaining on records, be it heavy metal or hip hop or blues, if we could get them to vote. <laughs> You know, yeah, yeah, not yeah, just man. sit at home and listen to their music or well, watch reality that, TV. Well, that, <laughs> but that music is trying to tell us something, and we're not. If we're just digging it for the groove, we're missing something, you know. And and I, you know me, I like to listen from the bottom up as much as anybody. I was taught by Paul Schaefer that yeah, that's yeah. An important thing to do. But when lyrics are talking about what's going on, you know, and and yes, we need all. It, it can't just be about that. There have to be love songs, you know. There has to be humor in everything, and that's where guys like Snoop Dogg are brilliant. You know, uh, it's the, the humor part of it. You know, I think if people see, you know, um, uh, Straight Outta Compton, you know that movie. Yeah, I think seeing that really turned my head to to the brilliance of of hip hop. You know, of, yeah, and and the history of it. Yeah. You see, because again, not if you look into the history of this stuff, it's fascinating. It's just rock and roll again. It's the well, same it's, thing. Yeah. Getting ripped off, getting ripped off. You know, putting a, you know, getting grabbed up, getting promoted. You know, the tragedy of a, a you know, a, a Easy E that's almost like a Brian Jones tragedy again. You know, like these guys that are catalysts. And then get overtaken by somebody else, and the band becomes a star. Yeah. You know, and it's it's like that's that's the same story right there, man. That's the same story, you know, of 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 Q, Ice Cube being elevated to the to be the leader, and Easy being the you know the fuck up. Yeah, yeah. You know, the guy that's whose whose inspiration it was, the spark, you know. But everybody can't, you know. It's a team. One guy doesn't carry the ball over the line, you know. Yeah. It's like a team. So. There's so much lesson to be learned in all, everything, and and not to judge music, to to expand your tastes, whoever you are, you know. So it's, you know, it's it's something I did as a kid. We were very judgmental, you know. Oh, this band sucks, you know. That's a, that's like really really that's teenage. Just, yeah. That's typical, yeah. and that's expected. But finding out later, man, hey, you know what? I really like Grand Funk Railroad, you know, <laughs> they're made great records. Sure did. You know? man. And, and, you know, and I was very, uh, it's funny, like when I was in high school, I was so into Frank Zappa, you know, I was so into that heady kind of shit, you know, that I didn't see what Neil Young doing was doing was even more brilliant on another, on another level. Not different, you know? just totally different. That's all. 
totally different, but we, we don't. And, and this is all part of that socio political problem of not accepting something different. Sure, man. A feeling that only what you like, you know, and, and, and religion does the same thing. Only my religion's good. You know, so we always do that. No, no, but it's, it's, but it's all the same thing, man. You know, it's crazy. It's all, you know, we all live under the same sky, you know, and the stars are in the same places, you know, and yet we can't, we can't get that together. Why can't we just get along? Well, you know, it's absolutely true. (laughs) I know. It's absolutely true. You know, maybe we can, you know, I mean, look. The Tampa Bay baseball team has every right to be there too. <laughs> <laughs> and on it's that not note, just about the Yankees and the Red Sox, you know. Hey, where but could they, but they, you know? <laughs> that was cold, Jimmy. Where could people? Um, no, no, but they, but they have been, a, they've been a surprise a comeback team like yeah, years. Man. Yeah, yeah, they have been a great team. Yeah. Where could people find out where you're touring and where you're playing? Where is you know, that, is that posted probably anywhere? My, website. my my guy Rennie Pinkus is like my manager uh, on this personal level of promoting gigs. I've been putting my own uh, my East Coast uh, Blue Soul Rockers and West Coast Blue Soul Rockers out there uh, on the website, you know. and it's on your Instagram. Yeah. Do you talk about? Is it on your? If, yeah, do, I put it okay. up on Instagram and, all the time too, wherever I'm playing. But so, come on out and say hello and bring your guitar. You know. Because well, you, you don't mean bringing you know, my guitar, but uh, hey, everybody, you know, just bring your guitar. Just come over, bring your guitar, man. You know, bring your guitar talk. and say, Jimmy, I heard you on every one of those guitar and Craig's show, and I'm playing with you. And I just started playing last week. <laughs> well, then you probably, like I said to you earlier, you probably have something to show me I don't know how to do. There you go, yeah. man. Let me tell people yeah. where to find you on Instagram, Jimmy V Music. Um, check out Jimmy at the Ace Hotel. It's three nights from the day this is broadcast uh, in LA. Um, it's Jimmy Vivino, and uh, he's also involved with the Blues Foundation. That's what this Ace Hotel benefit yeah, is for, and, correct? And the Americana uh, uh, Society, too, is involved with that. Yeah. Dude. So it's that's Blues Foundation and the Americana Society together for the first time on one one show. You know, So Barbara Newman and Jed Hilly, Barbara from the Blues Foundation and Jed Hilly from Americana, uh, who's a great, great guy and uh, one of my new friends. Uh, still making friends, folks. That's right. Dude, Not uh, Facebook friends, but real in person. Real friends. Blood friends. Hey, man, yeah. hang, hang on. I want to say goodbye and wrap up, but I just got to tell you, you're a very sincere guy, and I really appreciate your time, and I appreciate your sincerity, and thank you for some great freaking stories. Well, everybody's got them. You know, they're all interesting. Uh, you know, mine just happened to. I just happened to collide with a lot of my heroes, and uh, and came out. Uh, you know. Got off the mat a couple times, but I'm doing all right. And you and know. when you come out with a ne- a new record, you come on, and I have about 40 questions I never got to ask you. So we'll come on and we'll talk about oh, your yeah, new well, record. We'll go, I'm going to put that record out, too, that I started working on with Levon, you know, and uh, and and, uh, and Johnny Johnson and all them cats. You know, I, I just – I just uh, – I still feel so sad about the loss of, of my course. friends. But I guess I'll see them down the road, you know. And, I, and they're always in my record collection. So we'll put it out and please come on back on the show and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll check out there. We'll talk about your record and we'll, we'll listen to more of Jimmy V hang on. Let me wrap up. Thank you, Jimmy. I really mean it. Everybody, okay. everybody, thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed this interview, share it with a friend on your social media channels. We appreciate your support. Thanks again to Jimmy Vivinos for spending time with us and for sharing uh, a part of himself. And make sure you go to everyonelovesguitar.com and sign up to get on our newsletter list. And most important, remember that happiness is a choice, so choose wisely. Be nice, go play your guitar, and have fun. Till next time, peace and love, everybody. I'm out. We hope you enjoyed this show. If you did, subscribe to the Everyone Loves Guitar podcast, and you can do this online at everyonelovesguitar.com or on iTunes. And if you like the show, please leave us a five-star positive review. The more five-star reviews we get, the higher our show ranks, and higher rankings mean we get to continue speaking with cool, interesting guests on our show. We'll see you on the next episode, and until then, keep playing your guitar and have fun making music.